Karibuni Sana, and welcome to the opening ceremony of the Kalasha International Film and TV Market Festival and Awards 2024. We have the market where we discuss the business end of film and TV, how it actually makes money, makes sense. We're also going to be having the festival where you can actually enjoy those amazing productions and they've been curated for you to watch right across the city. I'm excited to be here, Jeff, and I'm expecting a lot of networking and um, finding collaborations and partnerships with industry stakeholders here and of course um, making new friends and learning a lot from the panel discussions and the workshops. Today is dedicated to our film industry and the entire ecosystem geared towards having fruitful outcomes as we kickstart this market. The government is committed to supporting and nurturing film industry, recognizing the economic, social and cultural significance. We are proud of strides that we have achieved thus far and believe that we are destined to make more strides as we progress in developing the local film industry and connecting to the world at large. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are glad to have you. I've already mentioned that we have quite a menu for all of us. In the course of the three, four days of being around the city, find time to uh, serve, to taste what the beautiful country and the beautiful city has to offer. The first trend we have noticed is partnerships. A long time ago we used to say, you know, that company, that one, multi-choice, they are our enemies. We no longer can define our enemies. There are no more enemies. The person who actually determines who an enemy is, is yourself. Our expectations is to also be part of learning in the Kalasha film and TV market because we are students ourselves and we want to make these connections because we are right in the heart of the industry as we enjoy the very good productions that have been made here in Kenya. As a government, we are committed to supporting and nurturing the film sector and we recognize its economic, social and cultural significance. We understand the importance of providing filmmakers with the resources, infrastructure and opportunities they need to thrive. And in the spirit of collaboration, ladies and gentlemen, we invite filmmakers and the media professionals from across the globe to forge partnerships, share ideas and explore new possibilities. Let this film market and the festive serve as a platform of dialogue, innovation and inspiration. Thank you so much. And with that, the PS declares the Kalasha market officially opened. Thank you. Karibuni Sana and welcome to the opening ceremony of the Kalasha International Film and TV Market Festival and Awards 2024. We have the market where we discuss the business end of film and TV, how it actually makes money, makes sense. We're also going to be having the festival where you can actually enjoy those amazing productions and they've been curated for you to watch right across the city. I'm excited to be here, Jeff, and I'm expecting a lot of networking and um, finding collaborations and partnerships with industry stakeholders here and of course um, making new friends and learning a lot from the panel discussions and the workshops. Today is dedicated to our film industry and the entire ecosystem geared towards having fruitful outcomes as we kickstart this market. The government is committed to supporting and nurturing film industry, recognizing the economic, social and cultural significance. We are proud of strides that we have achieved thus far 
and believe that we are destined to make more strides as we progress in developing the local film industry and connecting to the world at large. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are glad to have you. I've already mentioned that we have quite a menu for all of us. In the course of the three, four days of being around the city, find time to uh, savor, to taste what the beautiful country and the beautiful city has to offer. The first trend we have noticed is partnerships. A long time ago, we used to say, you know, that company, that one, multi-choice, they are our enemies. We no longer can define our enemies. There are no more enemies. The person who actually determines who an enemy is, is yourself. Our expectations is to also be part of learning in the Kalasha film and TV market because we are students ourselves and we want to make these connections because we are right in the heart of the industry as we enjoy the very good productions that have been made here in Kenya. As a government, we are committed to supporting and nurturing the film sector and we recognize its economic, social and cultural significance. We understand the importance of providing filmmakers with the resources, infrastructure and opportunities they need to thrive. And in the spirit of collaboration, ladies and gentlemen, we invite filmmakers and the media professionals from across the globe to forge partnerships, share ideas and explore new possibilities. Let this film market and the festive serve as a platform of dialogue, innovation and inspiration. Thank you so much. And with that, the PS declares the Kalasha market officially opened. Thank you. When you talk about sustainable and independent filmmaking, we know the barrier to entries have been brought down. And today, we will discuss, delve into this particular session. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, all of us will have figured out some ways that we can solve these emerging challenges that touch on independent filmmaking. We first of all need to know the market. Why are we filming and how can we gain money from more the, uh, the, the product we are involving in and it is the job of the producers to know and understand in the market. If you want to go beyond borders, research is, in, is key. You have to research global trends as well as local trends. If you're an indie filmmaker, what, what are some of these challenges that we face? There's a lack of like a kind of consolidated effort on an educational level that aligns this, our aspirations. It may look uh, easy or, or tough, but again, as long as you believe in yourself that you have that structure that you have to, sh to tell your story. Anyone can do it. Anyone can tell this kind of story. You just need to come to Africa and see how things work and how people are here. And for indie cinema, indie films, people, it is quite easy for us to tell this kind of story and it will sell in China. Which other avenues should Indies filmmakers explore to, to make returns on investment? How can you advise such a person who has a story, maybe has excellent actors, but does not know where to start? We as Africans know that we have to be ingenious in how we engage and relate and figure out our way. So we need to believe that we can figure out that way. Now we should start thinking about self-distribution. Then the next step, distributors will come after you. What is the place of a business plan for an independent filmmaker? And do you ever have an end in mind at any given time you are coming up with your story? So how can you make a business case as a filmmaker to anyone to say that this is um, an investment? You don't have an audience. 
And then we're always looking outside. We're saying, you know, like uh, Mr. Soko said, you know, grow your audience in Africa and in the diaspora. But what about in Kenya? Passion and love for stories does not put food on the table, as we know. And it's been a major concern. It's come up a number of times in this room. So, yes, we also do it for the money. But what industry doesn't? Show them that this is what I can do as a, as a cinematographer. Afternoon, hi guys. How are you? I know there's that lunchtime lethargy that checks in after the Ogali has, you know, done the thing. You know, and the Ogali is Ogaling, it happens. But this next conversation is really the hot button topic wherever you go. We're about to talk about artificial intelligence and filmmaking. And I just want to give you an overview of the menu that we'll have from now up until the evening. Because after this conversation, we speak about mental wellness for the film industry. How are we coping with the stress and anxiety that comes with, you know, being a creative, running the business, trying to make all of those ends meet. That happens after this particular panel discussion. And in the evening, multi-choice are making sure they give you an amazing mixer right here. Come in, network. Uh, hang out with people, get your contacts, because we've been told it's a contact business. Got to get those contacts. That happens in the evening, courtesy of MultiChoice. They also have a special screening of Zari. That happens at 5 p.m. We'll be giving you more details on that. But let's get to this particular panel discussion, because now we talk about artificial intelligence and filmmaking. Lots has been said about AI. Even yesterday, we had a discussion on dubbing and how it's actually changing the game right there. And the big question is, even as we get into this discussion, is it the barbarian at the gate, AI? Is it coming to take all our jobs? I can see some very young people here. Even before you've gotten into this space, AI wants to take your job. That's why we're here, to understand really how we leverage this particular tool to our advantage. That's a conversation that will be happening in this particular session. This session will be led by Dr. Ezekiel Onyango. 
you probably know him as Easy if you've worked uh, with him, prominent figure in Kenya's cultural and creative industries, an award-winning executive producer in film and TV. Uh, he's also knowledgeable when it comes to the creative economy, knowledge management, and stakeholder engagement, and is a cultural and creative researcher. Please put your hands together for Dr. Ezekiel Onyango. What a fitting intro. My God, this guy left nothing to chance. A round of applause for him, Tafadali. One love. Stand up and sing. One heart. Let's get together and. One love. to feel all right if you want to feel safe about the future kindly take your seats i thought lunchtime can be heavy so a little bit of moving would be nice thank you i am truly honored to be in front of you today and mostly honored to have an opportunity to talk about artificial intelligence now before i invite my panelists it is important for us to appreciate something, so I'll ask my friend Christine to do something. And I'll ask each one of you to take out your phones. And if your phone is able to scan that QR code there, kindly proceed to scan it. If it's not able to scan the QR code, I will ask you to go to menti.com at the top there and use that code to get onto this platform. And what I'll expect you to do is give me an honest answer of, do you think AI is a threat or an opportunity for the film industry in Kenya? So while you do that, I will proceed to invite the very, very rich panelists that we have today. And I'll call to stage a gentleman who studied music in France and is currently the Vice President, Media and Interactive Entertainment of Transperfect Media, a company that has global experience, global presence in doing what we call voice dubbing. And in voice dubbing, as you'll appreciate, artificial intelligence and connected technology are leading pathways in that field. So be ready to give a round of applause for Mr. Jacques Barou as he enters the stage. Welcome, Jacques. Kindly take a seat there. My second guest is somebody that I'll struggle to introduce simply because uh, he's too knowledgeable to introduce. This is a gentleman who is the group CEO and president of Pathways International, a professor of practice in the University of Denver, and my fellow village mate from Nyanza. And this is none other than Mr. Joel Onditi. Kindly please join us on stage. Thank you, Prof. Now, the next person, recently appointed Envoy of Technology by the Government of Kenya, a true indication of the intention of making Kenya a global hub in the space of technology. Beyond that, sits in the distinguished position of advisor on AI at the UN for the UN Secretary General. I will speak no further but call on to stage Mr. Philip Thigo. A round of applause as he joins us on stage. Thank you, sir. And last, the spectacle of the day. As creatives, we always talk about copyright law and all these things but in kenya one synonymous name always rings when you talk about these spaces and this is none other than the lady who runs the tribunal that deals with these matters and i'll now call on stage liz lenjo please she's the only lady on stage so give her a heavy heavy clap as she comes in 
Thank you. So now, as the IEBC is verifying our results, <laughs> I shall say, close the polls. It is interesting that our audience today think that AI is a great opportunity for Kenya. That's an interesting finding, and that is indeed what we are supposed to talk about today. So I'm really glad that we share that opinion together. Christine? Now, before we go back to the first slide, before we begin, I'd like to share with you a very small story. In 1999, we were all scared that the world was going to end, our watches will not respond, and something will happen. <laughs> so that is the day I also decided to be a bit naughty, and me and my late sister went to Carnival for the New Year bash. National media were holding a party, and she used to work there. And I was very anxious looking at my Casio watch at what will happen at midnight. And then nothing happened. And we are here today. 24 years later, technology proved that it can perform beyond human expectation and human uh, intelligence. With that in mind, I'm going to speak about many things. We are going to speak about opportunities that are there. We're going to speak about challenges that are there. Then we're going to dive into the area of ethical considerations when you're working in this space, and then we'll discuss the future prospects. And we will, of course, engage with you as we proceed in this conversation. So I'll start with Jacques, as he's a man in production. And Jacques, I'd like to you to paint us a nice picture of what does it mean to a filmmaker or a practitioner, somebody who in the whole value chain is concerned with how to produce with or supported by AI. Thank you very much. Um, so AI is a toolbox. You have a lot of tools and uh, we can use the tools not to create but to help the creation. So I think the most important point is how do we use AI? And AI has a lot of different branches. Uh, I'm more a sound guy than a picture guy. We can do so many things with AI. We can, uh, as a filmmaker, you can use AI to uh, start a sketch, start a visual. You can use AI to uh, locate one particular face in a, a, a crowd uh, to be used after whenever you want. You can use AI for simulation. So instead of Dry, uh, drawing a sketch of your next scene, you can use AI to visualize and to be more precise in your creation. My guess is people will learn how to use AI and it will help the creation. It will not be against the creation because at the end, AI doesn't think, AI doesn't feel, and we are using our body a lot. Uh, I'm an expert in dubbing, so I can tell you that I always tell the actor, feel, move in front of a microphone, because if not, you are not going to understand what's going on on screen. So AI doesn't feel anything. And that's uh, where the human will always, uh, will always win, because they will use AI and they will decide at the end. Thank you. I've picked a key word there that I'd like all of us to take home. AI is a toolbox. Remember that every day. And that leads me to the next question that I'll bring to you, Prof, which is filmmaking is just like any other business. It has processes. And we appreciate the role AI would play in increasing efficiency and output. Now, if we look at AI as a toolbox in the process of pre-production where you imagine an idea, you script it, then you get to production where you actually actualize the idea, the industrial process of it, and then how you distribute it to the consumers. Would you say AI would drive efficiency or would it bring it backwards? Thank you very much. <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the issue of AI has been, let's say, a challenge to very many people. And I'm going to go back to academia for a second. Um, as at last year, maybe two years ago, I remember a couple of uh, 
US university professors came together and they're saying, look, this thing is, is telling every, everyone everything about exams. No one is learning. Should we stop it? Should we continue with it, right? Initially, there's a lot of rejection, uh, but then eventually everyone agreed that, look, this thing is beneficial, it's here to stay. I'm gonna compare this to the days when, I don't know how old people are here, but the days used to have like logbooks, logbooks to do mathematics, right? You know, and we had to use logbooks. Now we can patch the numbers quickly and get our results out, right? So I'm gonna go back to what Jack said. This is a toolbox, and the toolbox is available for us to use, right? In the US right now, a lot of exams are open book exams because they're telling you that in the real world, when you get out there, these tools are available to you. They are open, they are available for you to use them. It's a matter of how do you, as an expert within a particular industry, leverage these tools to produce better, faster, more cost-effective you know, um, you know, uh, um, um, artifacts, right? So to answer your question, in the film industry, in production, look at the toolbox, open your toolbox, look for your spanner number eight, which could be your, your script, scripting AI, right? Let it get you there faster. Then, of course, you bring a creative mind and then complete it. Look for, you know, the screwdriver, which could be some, some um, imaging AI solution, right? So, so look for all the different tools in your toolbox and then be able to create your work much more effectively. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, we could do process, but now I want to talk about value. Uh, I think when ChatGPT came around, we were all amazed at the capability of ChatGPT3, ChatGPT4. And now there is this new thing called Sora. And it has caused a lot of anxiety to a lot of editors and a lot of linear <laughs> programmers. Um, what would you tell people who have learned how to edit the hard way that now there is a solution somewhere that can do their job? How do they align themselves? to have this particular thing called Sora as a toolbox, but not as a competition for them. And this question will be for Philip. And the reason I've given him that question is because he's our envoy of technology. And these are all his children. So <laughs> thank you, Philip. Yeah, violence has been a thing today. Um, thank you so much, and to the CEO for getting me into this panel. Um, how many people understand what AI is? Show of hands. By experience, don't worry. I have. I was telling my colleagues here that I was talking to people in the agriculture space, and by the end of two hours, the AI I was talking about was not the AI they were thinking about. So this is not artificial insemination. It's artificial intelligence. So let's just have fluency at the baseline. So show of hands. This is a workshop. It's not a problem. How many? understand artificial intelligence. Just understand it. Please don't be shy. About half of the group, so sometimes I really have to do that check, because yes, and yet, to your poor, <laughs> um, people are saying there's opportunity, so you can actually see maybe the definitions are a problem. So just for us to have a, sim a similar baseline, so AI basically is capability of computers to do human tasks. So I'm trying to answer your question in many ways. So that's your baseline. So don't worry, you all understand it. Maybe it's just the definition that you've not necessarily understood it. And those are early days, right? So early days, this is 2017, 2018, when AI was still new. So you had that capability of, 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 of sort of computers being able to do your, you know, tasks that you could be able to do. And it was early days, so self-driving cars. You know this, right? Alexa. Alexa, Siri, so you all use it. Your email, Gmail, right? Uh, when you start to write your Gmail, it completes your Gmail. When you go to search, it completes your search. That's AI. So how many people now understand AI? Again, level set, show of hands, <laughs> an increased group. So you're actually using it. So that's what I always tell people. You're using it in every day. You just don't understand this as artificial intelligence. It means... A lot of the things that you do now are easier to do, are much more faster. You don't do the mundane things that you used to do. So to your point, you need to have a certain level of a skill set so that you're able to leverage on artificial intelligence, which means 
the things that you'll have done mundane around, for example, videos, you don't have to do that because then AI simply then builds off what you're doing to be able to produce it and make it much better. And to Joel's point, um, it doesn't mean that having chat GPT means that you are better at anything else unless you know how to prompt it gives you my former, while well, I'm still transitioning, um, at ASU, we're the first university that has a collaboration with OpenAI. And we basically are encouraging students to actually use GPT in class. Yes. And we found that it actually improves kids, students' analytical capacity, ability to ask questions, ability to interact, interrogate. It's interesting. And so to the point, there's a lot of opportunity if you understand how to leverage this, uh, these, these tools, but then you need to have a level of skills. Thank you. Now, on the issue of skills, would you say then it is important for practitioners to consider upskilling themselves? Kindly speak to that. No, it's not, it's not, an, it's not even an option, right? Uh, it's, it's a must, right? So, because there are three parts of skilling, right? So, because we honestly, we are not all at the same level, right? So there's, depending on where you are, of course you've had the Casio people. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know your age now. Uh, so basically the skilling, right? So a lot of the people are coming into, into fray. Africa is 19.7, median age. So we have a lot of people who are still getting into this place. So we have a lot of opportunity around skilling. The opportunity to, to, to be, you know, how do I say it? Um, digital natives, that's the bigger chunk. Then there's the upskilling piece. So people are already in industry. Uh, and so there's an opportunity to upskill. So if you're already in industry, AI just found you and it keeps on finding you, the AI of 2017 is not the one of 2022, is definitely not the one of 2024. And I'm telling you, next year, there's something else coming. It will not be the same. So even the, the people who are skilling will have to upskill next 2022. And then there's reskilling because it keeps on changing. So you have to play in both. Three. <laughs> skilling, upskilling, skilling. And I speak to not just the capability, but the mindset. What you need is an agile mindset. Understand it's changing. Understand that there's not an end right now to education. There's not an end to skilling, regardless of the age that you are. Thank you so much. And I hope you have all taken that in. Skill. Let's say together, it is skill. Again, skill. Ah, now you just whisper. He'll be left behind. Uh, when we do all this, we skill ourselves. We upskill and we reskill. And we learn how to use this toolbox. One big question will pop up. Where are my rights going to sit? If AI did half the work, who owns this image that has been that I'm using in the edit. So a confusion around that space on corporate protection and IP regulations will show up. And I'd like to talk to Madam Liz about this because in Kenya, when people see your name, they just see copyright. And you look like copyright. So <laughs> you're, 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 you're trademarked and you, nobody else will ever look like you. So please tell us about this. What do we think AI algorithms or solutions will respond to this or what do we need to prepare ourselves so that we can be able to still harness the value of IP in working in collaboration with AI? Okay. Um, you know, as, as legal practitioners when we're talking about AI, there are so many issues to unpack, right? Because we're, uh, we're seeing the disturbance it's causing, the positives and the negatives, right? Um, and as Philip pointed out, AI is... Um, you know, replicating what human a human would do, right? And when you look at the creative sector and with the AI, it's basically what you get when you do the search engine and you use chat GPT and whatnot, it's literally an amalg amalgamation of what has been in the spaces, right? And one thing also we realize with, with people in general, they don't understand that even if something is available to the public, it doesn't mean it is public, it is public domain. There's usually a misunderstanding as to what public domain means in intellectual property law. And what it simply means is that this is work whose rights have expired. 
that's when it becomes free to use. So just because you find it on the internet does not mean it is free. It's someone's work. Now, with AI also, we are seeing that now some of these creations borrow from a lot of things. So now enter the question or the issue of derivative works. Yeah. So whenever we are using AI, we also have to interrogate. Are we looking at you know, something that has been created afresh? Is that really the case? Um, with even the different platforms that we have access to AI technology, are you reading the terms and conditions to understand what the impact it has also on what you're putting together? Because you may be creating or may not be creating, again, because you're borrowing. You're picking from different elements. And that has been the issue when it comes to, okay, um, if I create something using AI, who owns it? So it will literally go down to uh, what are these so-called quote-unquote raw materials? What, where are they coming from for you to ascertain who would be the author of that works? And then remember, this is an AI platform created by someone. They will have terms and conditions around that. How does that impact this intellectual property that you're creating? Yeah. So it's open source, but yes, it's open source, and then open source, and then what? What does that mean when I use it to create my things? Yeah. So there's a whole myriad of issues when it comes to copyright issues and IP protection um, in general. And then, remember, we're also in the film business, we're dealing with people's images. So again, that brings another kettle of fish, data protection. And data protection and, and how it's been, it's, it's been crafted and understood now, it's also disrupting how we are also looking at things like model release forms as filmmakers. Because remember, under the Data Protection Act, they say, uh, consent can easily be given, it should be easily given and easily withdrawn. So what does that mean when you have those fancy contracts with words like perpetuity? We love to use that word, right? So it, it comes to a, and an, it, it's a whole issue, right? I'm going to create a voice using AI. Where am I deriving these elements, yeah? Is it that the three gentlemen who are here, we give them a mic and they all speak at once, say a word, we find a sound, and then that becomes the voice. If that is the case, then I have to clear those rights before Jacques decides to go and use it for his film or something like that. So you see, like, there are so many issues to untangle. So whenever someone is using AI and they imagine that there is a one-size-fits-all, there isn't because there will be so many things to look into and to interrogate. But at the same time, on a policy and a legal uh, uh, level, there are definitely things that must be addressed. Because we need to start thinking about, um, you know, with the blood right lines in terms of infringement. What is infringement? Um, is AI um, fostering innovation or does it need to be regulated? Those are the conversations. Thank you. I still will stay with you because as a part, we are still on this other side of the divide where we are creating and we are producing the content. And it's now at a place where it's been produced and it's about to go to market. And you've unpacked and it makes sense that there'll be a lot of things to consider. Now, we'll go back to what Philip said. We will still need to skill ourselves and to understand what we need to unpack. However, for the filmmaker who has done the work and they've used AI tools and they're at a place that they're now ready to go to market, what advice would you give them that is straightforward and simple. As when you begin your journey to create and you want to co-create using AI, these are the things to consider when you're starting and along your journey that will not get them into trouble at the end. Okay, so I'd say first, understand what is this tool for. The terms and conditions and understand what that impact has. And then now as you are incorporating other things as you're creating, you make sure that you clear those rights as well. Because you definitely need some also human intervention here to create something new, something different. You want to deliver some emotion. Because we've seen also AI has not been 100. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so it's literally now making sure that everyone else that you're working with, you also have the relevant contracts, right? Because, um, you know, with film, it's always about that issue of chain of titles. 
right? So again, now looking at all these various IP assets that you've used, any third party intellectual property, you have cleared it, you have the contracts. And I always tell, um, you know, anyone who's using IP, you also have to be very clear and transparent about the nature of the use. So for example, if I'm a filmmaker, I should be clear from the beginning that if I'm working with third parties, I'm going to use it in a festival, if I plan to distribute it on platforms, like do all that, be transparent from the beginning because you don't want someone to come back at, uh, after you've sealed a deal and they tell you, oh, you misrepresented in the contract, you only said this or you implied this and then now you're back you're probably in a courtroom or in my tribunal trying to resolve that situation. So that it would literally just be the contract element and making sure you clear what that does not belong to you. On the same space of regulation, I would, I'd like for Philip and Joel to, to add on to that because there's data protection. There is, does it help piracy? Does it make it harder to even understand IP? Uh, we, under, we appreciate that technology like AI, connected technology is dematerializing the process. We are not using a lot of physical material or no DVDs and all that. So please chip into this part. Yeah, so that's an interesting point. I mean, we're living in the data and AI age, and that means that we are either consuming data, images, voice, and all that, or we are consuming tools that whose raw materials is data, you know, um, images, pictures, voice, and all that. So we're living in an age where we have to be we have to be aware of what we are using and consuming. I'll give a very quick example: Adobe. You know, there's images out there online. I like the point that, that, that you raised when you said that if you find a picture out there, it doesn't mean you can just take it and use it, right? Because that is somebody's picture. So Adobe probably has stock images. You know, you, know, you have to pay for them and, and, and get the rights to use them. So as we are consuming AI, um, let's say utility, we have to also ask ourselves, is this, is this uh, free? Am I allowed to use it? How much am I allowed to use it? To what extent am I allowed to use it? And now when we come to producing the AI utilities, for example, we have things like explainability. How did my AI come to get to this particular answer or this particular functionality, right? And so I agree uh, that I think the, the main thing is to, is to read the fine print, make sure that whatever you're doing is right. It will be really embarrassing if, for example, you're at an award ceremony, you're winning an award, and then you're slapped with a legal letter that says you're not supposed to have used that particular thing. So uh, in Kenya, for example, we have the Data Privacy uh, and Protection Act. You know, there's things like um, um, consent, right, and, and things like that. So I'd like to urge everyone, you know, we play in the data and AI space. Whatever we do, we are always looking and asking ourselves, do I have the rights to use this? Am I infringing on anyone's rights? Um, otherwise, Am I registered as, as a data processor, right? The, those, uh, the DPA um, rules that we have to follow. So again, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to urge any heavy users of AI and, and, and such like tools to really, you know, um, retain an attorney if you can uh, to be able to explain for you some of this um, uh, concept. Thank you. So, Philip, please, and then Jacques also, because this is a very critical subtopic of our conversation today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, come from it from what, from what I was doing at the global level uh, in terms of governance of AI. So last week, I uh, urge you to go check. We just uh, uh, pushed through an, a resolution in the United Nations on artificial intelligence. So it's the first one, at least attempting a global governance of artificial intelligence. And we have interesting recommendations there. We are absolutely telling countries not to rush to regulate. Absolutely. We understand governance. We understand guardrails. We absolutely are advocating for sandboxes, but not regulation. So it, it's something that people are finding strange. But what are you regulating? Let's start from there. Um, second thing. What you're realizing is that, and you'll find this is funny, that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligent. I'm reinforcing their points. That's the truth. Forget the hype.
it's neither artificial because the data is not artificial and neither is it intelligent because it requires humans intelligence to process it and to run it so forget the hype i always tell people hype is a problem where you run into a problem because of those two things is that remember i mentioned the first ai 2017 to 2022 now 2022 is where we got into generative artificial intelligence. The fact of generative, you start to run into problems, like copyright, because AI is building off other pieces of work, which can be proprietary or free. When it's free, that's why you have the hallucinations, right? And the biases, because then you do not know whether the source is. So the cure that we are having at the global level and this is sometimes, I, we are users, but I want to give the users a little bit of slack. There's also responsibility by the technology companies. Because how do they train their data? So again, understanding how AI works, right? AI is like your brain. As I said, it's making machines do what human beings can do. Human beings will do what they learn. So how AI works is it learns. It learns from what? From a certain content, from certain data. So then, who's training it is a company. So there's also a responsibility to the companies to, what, to do what we say watermarking. They have to mark what they're training or where they're training their AIs. So it's a dual responsibility. So I really need also to push uh, the big tech companies, especially the big ones, Anthropic, OpenAI, Google, Microsoft, to also start taking responsibility around watermarking that content so that your responsibility. So when you infringe, you've actually infringed deliberately because then it was watermarked, you knew for sure that content was somebody else and you've not cited. Same thing as plagiarism. I think we all know this if you've gone to, if you've gone to university. So, so basically, the, 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 I think I wanted to bring those, those sort of big buckets around that. Then it comes basically then to, to then the governance space. Right? And so if we can speak a lot around how do we then collectively govern artificial intelligence? Then assigning, because how do you govern? You assign rights, responsibilities, and stuff like that. So for me, the rights and responsibilities needs to be the universal rights and responsibilities, not company. Is you call it what? Uh, community, those ones. <laughs> community, whatever. Because community regulations for companies are for their shareholders. They are not necessarily respecting the human rights, uh, you know, sort of, global normative standards around this, which then protects or begin to protect a lot of the users, whether it's the IP owner, but also the user, just from in case the law is very gray, and right now, the law is very gray. That speaks to something like extended user, extended uh, producer responsibility. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Jacques. What Philippe said is very important. Uh, don't rush for the regulation, because regulation comes always after innovation. So you have innovation, and people realize, well, we have something new, how do we regulate? So it's always after, and you're absolutely right. Um, I can tell you that um, a few years ago, um, when I was uh, working for Warner Brothers be before joining Transperfect, I was very involved in game, game localization. So we had a lot of contract. We have an assignment of rights for the actors to dub all the movies. Great. And the game started to be a really hype. So we started to do games. And I was talking to all the actors worldwide, and they had no regulation for the games. So they had something in place, what we call assignment of rights, so I can buy your rights to dub a specific actor on a certain film, but for games, we did not have that. So the regulation came after. And for a few years, it was a mess. It was a jungle. So I think right now, we are at this point. And don't rush. So I can tell you that in America, a few, year, a few months ago, they had a huge strike. And one of the big points were the writers being scared of not having a job because ChatGPT would write the script for them. Um, and after, the actors were also very scared of that. Um, so, right now, um, you have a lot of 
people worldwide using the tool, but without knowing really what needs to be regulated. So the Europeans are going to be the first one next year, in 2025, they are going to start the EU AI Act, which is going to have three levels of risks. So you have very high risk, medium risk, low risk. My field, production, localization, is on the low risk. But being on the low risk means that any sound, any likeness of somebody, Liz knows that very well, any likeness of somebody, which can be the voice, the image, whatever, I will have to divulge the source. And you were, Liz, talking about if we create uh, something, if I take the f four of us, five of us, and I do a blend of voice, and I'm going to create, yesterday I was talking a little bit about that, synthetic voices. I'm going to create a synthetic voices. It won't be yours, it won't be mine, it would be something else. Well, who has the rights for that? So the EU will oblige the users to divulge all the sources that created this voice. Thank you. I think you'll agree with me, you're being pleasantly surprised, right? The fear and the anxiety is slowly, slowly seeping away. Now that we've talked about the toolbox, that will help you as creators work. I think it's important we talk about our customers, the audience. How does AI help us as an industry to create better experiences for our audience? How does it become a tool for audience development? And I would like Joel to speak to this in the aspect of you're now not looking at primary users of AI, but consumers of AI. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take a step back before we even get to the amazing wow AI. I just move back to data because AI for me is a maturity. We look at that maturity level of uh, leveraging data. We can begin from data analytics, just analyzing data and being able to find insights from data. Uh, specifically, uh, one of our US customers uh, was before COVID, unfortunately they went down, was Regal Cinemas. And Regal Cinemas, what we were doing for them was, was a very key uh, project where we would, would collect um, movie attendance, we would collect demographic information from all their customers, we would slice and dice the information and tell them who is their customer. So these guys knew their customers very well, right? And so what, what, what they use information for is as they are planning to release a movie, should we release the movie in January versus in August? Should we release the movie for kids? And, and what is the appetite maybe for Latinos, for blacks, for America, you know, for different audiences. So the same way in banks, for example, they say KYC, know your customer. You know, um, a big use of data analytics, which leads to the AI, is can we know our audience? So as a filmmaker, as a producer, do you know your audience? And that starts by collecting data, collecting feedback, just like what we did here earlier, um, of the people consuming your products and then leveraging these AI tools now to tell you who is truly your audience. Now we build what we call profiles of your audience, right? You can have Christians, you can have maybe the old. You can say profile A is between 30 to 40 or 45, male, you know, income bracket is roughly this and that. So for me, I think that's one of the very, very big uses which is truly getting to understand your audience because they're the ones who buy your products. Thank you. Thank you. That's on the perspective of the producer still, but I'd like for Philip to tell me about my grandmother in Masiro who wants to watch a movie. How can AI improve her experience? Thank you. Hey, grandmother. This is, this is the second day I'm getting grandmother. <laughs> it's so funny. I, th I think if you think about artificial intelligence and, and, and from the use cases I mentioned, right? So. Think about even your email, right? So I think by the time you do your 10th email, it starts to complete some things that you're used to. So I think AI, in the sense of my grandmother, well, I don't have a grandmother right now, but I think it's accessibility enhancement, right? So in terms of just accessibility, think about a film being translated in real time. You know that's possible. 
and the yes, and the mouth moves, you know, not like those telenovelas, you know, that you get that guy. <laughs> that, it's the same guy who's always translating. So you kind of have accessibility enhancements, and it can enhance accessibility for different people, even in the same location. So that's what AI does, uh, because it's customized, right? So it's, it understands you, it understands, uh, potentially there's a, a very specific Luya dialect that you speak to. That's, those are the possibilities, right? So it's not, it's not, Luyas are not all the same, right? And it can also nuance the jokes, depending on how you see. So for me, those are the realms of possibilities that it's not one product. It's a product that speaks to different audiences differently and they get to appreciate it. So AI has become quite interesting. The second part, of course, is in terms of the habits, right? So your viewer habits, like for me, I like to forward some things, eh? I, stuff I don't watch. And what AI does is it learns your habits in terms of what you watch, your preferences, the types of movies you like, how it curates it, so that you're not necessarily wasting time. You know, because we're already in a culture of on-demand culture, but now the on-demand, is evo the experience is even better. The third part, which is not grandmother, is very much around this generation, is the immersiveness of what you're seeing. You want to interact with the movie. You know, you just don't want to sit. Uh, and I think we, you've seen the, the rise of the VR, AR, Pokemon Go was a thing. So you want to be almost bring the movie into this environment. And I'm seeing that is the biggest thing right now. So we're calling it spatial computing. Uh, we are now, you know, the sort of the, the goggles are becoming cheaper. I forgot the, the other one is expensive. The Apple one is still 3.5, but you can see the Oculus and the rest. So for me, that is actually interesting in terms of uh, how a viewer can influence a story. So you literally get into the story, and based on you interacting, you can determine the next course of action. So that creates even better outcomes for content creators, right? Because you know how you want a movie to end? Who's been part of that story? The alternate ending, right? Yes. Or somewhere in the movie, there's a guy you really want to die, you know, <laughs> instead of the other guy. So, so that's AI, that you can actually, as a creator, as you can create many alternative stories in one movie so that a user can determine the path that they want to go in that particular movie. So for me, that's, that's what I, I, I see can happen for an audience. Now, good people, what they have just unpacked should now finish any anxiety that you had. Because if you're an editor and you're feeling like Sora is going to take your job, maybe you can now consider how can I use my editing skills and get some AI tools to now be able to do live captioning. Like he has said, you will still be very relevant in that space. How can I, as a VFX artist, now talk about, I'm going to focus on how I will give film producers the opportunity to, pre to give their audiences immersive experiences. You know, you could even go to the museum. That's a new output. So the producer sees uh, a big audience reach. They'll go to cinema, and then maybe they'll come to a special place where people can do immersive experiences. So the opportunities are enormous if you allow yourselves to see through the information that's being unpacked here today. Now, Lise and Jacques, this story of audience development uh, touches very heavily on copyright protection. If I give my movie to somebody to create an immersive experience with it, what will I need to think about legally? That will be your question. OK. Um so there's one or two things I wanted to react to, then yes. I go to that question. So Joel had mentioned about stock images, and it would have been an injustice if I didn't address it. Um, whenever creatives are using stock images, they fail to read the fine print of the terms and conditions. And um, you find that when you use stock images, you're like, oh, I see this cute chick, I can use this image, right? But you know, in most of these stock images, uh, terms and conditions, they have not cleared image rights. Did you know that? I have had suits <laughs> um, where I have had to explain to clients that there was, an, there was a lack of understanding in that regard and that they actually 
um, had to clear some image rights. It was like, oh, I bought the picture, I paid X amount of dollars. So please read the fine print. You're better off even just come to Ezekiel, I like how you look, let me take a picture, I pay you, I want to do one, two, three. You're even better off do that, doing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, um, in terms of now, uh, you know, I've created this story and, uh, you know, so now we enter into copyright. Copyright gives you the, uh, the strength or rather the right to control what you create, right? So now in this instance, we're going to get into the realm of derivative works. So in this instance, it means that now a new work will be created, but from your original work. So you're part of the equation. Please repeat. <laughs> so um, it's basically creation of a new work from the original works. So the art lies in also how you negotiate your contracts. Okay, guys? The art lies in how you negotiate your contracts. But it first starts with how you understand your rights. So that now you ensure you, you get a good deal. You get to ask also the right questions, right? Uh, so when you, when you ask the right questions, they will be captured in the contract. You leave no room for either misunderstanding or very broad provisions such that now you are caught up in any and all of the uses herein. You know, we use flamboyant words as lawyers. <laughs> yeah, so you're not caught up in that. Enumerate. And I tell parties in any contract, it's a negotiation. Everyone should put their cards on the table. Otherwise, th this deal will not be even an ethical deal. We just be clear about it. And when you don't want to be embarrassed, being challenged, receiving an award, as he said, and then someone is slapping you, you're being served on an award stage. And either that would be a good strategy to serve someone when they're, being <laughs> when they're receiving an award. <laughs> Thanks for that idea. So, but yeah, so understanding the rights helps you broker the right deal. Um, so which means you understand it's a derivative works, it's a derivative works. We're talking about, like in Kenya, we have a voluntary registration of copyright. So when you're going to register this copyright, are you leaving me out of this registration? Yeah, because it literally goes down to those basics. So we have to get the parties to have these conversations and be very transparent. Yeah, um, again, it will come up, it will delve into the next level of, okay, so what else am I building on now that I am li licensing your work? What happens to this new work or what kind of claim can you have? So it's, you know, as a, as a creative also, you want to exercise some element of control so that you're always in the equation. I like, to give, I like to give the example of J.K. Rowling. When you look at all the assets her books, her reporter have created, she gets something and she still gets to control something. Like, you know, she's, she's always in the mix through her representatives. So you always want to be in that situation as well because this pie will keep growing. The work will morph and morph and morph and become this huge thing. So once you understand that at least the basic IP is yours, make sure that you plug in. Yeah. Again, we are here to unpack opportunities because you say you think AI has opportunities. If you make a film and it's going on streaming platforms and cinema, those are your customers. But if the same film, given what Liz has explained, derivative works, is transformed for consumption in immersive experiences, those are new customers. That's a whole new reach. So there's two opportunities there for the individuals who will want to create that immersive experiences and a bigger audience, which means more revenue for you as a creator. Keep thinking on that. Now, as we have, as we have spoken about audience development, I'd now like to move to the session where we'll talk about challenges of AI. And this is going to be a session where this will start with Jacques because he is currently working with a toolbox or many toolboxes in AI and he'll be able to unpack for us the challenges, especially in the ecosystem of producing. Now, before we get to that, I'd like to ask uh, Christine to put slide number three on the screen. So that as we talk and you have questions to ask, you can still go back to the Mentimeter and submit your questions. So that at the end of the session, we'll look at who's best positioned to respond to the questions that you submit as we speak. So you can be doing that as we continue to have this conversation. So Jacques, challenges of AI in filmmaking and 
be as real and as simple as possible. Thank you. Really? <laughs> so I, I'd like to, I, I'd like just to one minute to, to answer Liz about J.K. Rowling because um, years ago when I was in Los Angeles, I had the pleasure of controlling the dubbing of Harry Potter, the eight movies in worldwide languages. And, um, and we were creating, I was working for Warner Brothers at the time, we were creating glossaries of all these weapons, these uh, spells, etc. And at a certain time, I don't remember, it was after Harry Potter 2, 3, um, a fan base, a group of fans, created a glossary and uh, put their own definition to, to help the, the audience to understand the universe of Harry Potter. Well, you're absolutely right. J.K. Rowling said, no, 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 no. I control all the IPs of Harry Potter. And this fan base, well, was uh, forbidden to publish anything about the about Harry Potter universe. So you're absolutely right. That reminds me uh, the anecdote. Uh, <clears throat> talking about challenges. That's a very good question because um, after the emergence of internet, would you say internet was a threat or an opportunity? Oh, it was great. People could communicate. It was fantastic. But now we are also seeing fake news, fake news everywhere that comes from the internet. So coming back to the tool, the tool is whatever you want to do with the tool. Um, I often take the, the example of the hammer. A hammer in your toolbox is something where it helps you to put a nail in, in the wall. You cannot do that by the hand. You can do that with the tool. So it's a great tool. But if you hit somebody with a hammer, you kill him. So the tool is good and bad at the same time. So my concern is about the dissemination of fake news. And, you know, I spend most of my life in America, and I can tell you that uh, in the, the center south states of America, you have a lot of believers that the planet is flat. And... Uh, you, even one guy, I remember a few years ago, that built uh, um, a spaceship to prove that the Earth was flat, and so he went, and of course he died because it was not <laughs> constructed very well, so, but his, his point was to prove that the planet was flat. flat. So coming back to ChatGPT, ChatGPT is going to re-engurgitate, re sorry, all the data that you put into it. So that's what Philip was talking about, hallucination, bias. If I put a prompt in ChatGPT and asking, uh, can you tell me why the planet is flat? ChatGPT is going to explain to you why the planet is flat. Because you have a lot of data that explain to you why or that the planet is flat, which is not true. But at this point, it doesn't really matter. So we have to be really careful to make sure that we put the right data in, uh, in, uh, in, in the feeding of AI, because AI is like a huge monster that is fed with data. And the data can come from everywhere. So right now, one of the issues with Africa is most of the data is coming from America, is coming from English language. So, uh, if I want to do voice modeling in Swahili, I'm going to have a problem because there is no data about that. So I will have to record somebody and I will have to make a contract with them talking about what we said earlier. So everything can be legal, legal as, as long as we have contracts. But we have to use the tool the best way possible. And another example, the, like I said, the AI doesn't think, so it's up to us to explain to AI or to use AI, but control the thinking. Years ago, I think it was Google, they started to, uh, to create a little city and have automatic cars, you know, uh, uh, the cars that are driving alone. So they built a little city and the car was doing very well. And at a certain point, the car, boom, stops. And everybody 
is, was asking at this point, why did the car stop? There is nothing on the road, uh, there is no animal crossing, why did the car stop? The car stopped because on the side of the road, you had two workers coming, just walking, and one of them had a t-shirt with the symbol stop. So it was on the side, but the car didn't think the car saw stop, stops. So, <laughs> so that's the difference between the human and the AI. So I think AI is great. It's an opportunity if we know how to use it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joel. Mic check. Yep, there you go. Thank you very much, Jack. That's really good. Just a quick follow-up on Jack's point about uh, localization. What we're doing at Pathways Technologies, for example, uh, or by the way, we are a local Microsoft data and AI partner. And so what our young people um, are doing is doing a lot of localize, localizing these AI models. Uh, because, like you said, if you train an AI model using data from someplace else, it's going to give you in that context. And, and, and I don't know if any of you has tried speaking to somebody who is using Google Translate or, you know, like a non-African or Kenyan, for example, using Google Translate. I was at a meeting yesterday and um, somebody from the US was trying to shine in their Swahili and, the, and the, their speech was supposed to be ladies and gentlemen and, and they came and said, wajane na mabwana, you know, so the, from chat GPT, right? So you can tell that the, like, it's, it's really not the right thing, right? So localization of AI models is very important and so we are doing quite some work and I was talking to, to Jack about our training programs and getting local data scientists to actually work on some of their uh, programs to localize some of these models. But moving on to some of the challenges that, that, that we face. For me, the first one, I think, is jobs. Jobs are going to be lost. We have to keep it real, right? Jobs are going to be lost. But as someone who has probably listened to interviews almost all my life when I'm interviewing people, the challenge can be turned into an opportunity. Right? So they say AI will take away our jobs, but I would say people who are using AI will take away our jobs, not AI. So if you're a film producer or video editor, you've got to figure out a way to use AI. How is AI being used in my career? So I speak about AI almost every week. What I tell guys is figure out within your industry, how is AI applicable in my industry? So that's one of the challenges. So adopt or die the law of, I think, natural selection. So you have to figure out tonight when you get home, what AI tools, what's that toolbox that, that I need to start using today because you cannot afford to not use it. You know, you'll be swept away. Um, so that's one. The second thing I'd like to talk about is uh, probably coming from the academia as well is just original work, original content, right? I think there's a very big risk of having, you know, fake people around and of course it goes back to all to, to the legal side of things. There are people who are okay doing copyright because they are fine with it, right? I'm sure a few of you have bought Adibas, you know, maybe shoes or t-shirt, yeah? So there are people who are okay with that. And AI will just make it easier for those people to do some of these things, right? So we'll have people maybe receiving awards and maybe you guys from the industry, you're like, no, 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 this guy, man, I've put in a lot of work, right? So for me, I think there's a challenge with that. Of course, that's where regulators will come in. Of course, that's where the legal side aspects will come in as well. But the truth is that AI is here with us. You know, it's here to stay. So as professionals in, in the film industry, it's a matter of figuring out how do we take part in this. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'll, I, I, I just want to take top of mind on the jobs thing. Please. Because <laughs> I'm part of the World Economic Forum stories. So I think if you look at it, it's to the extent that like any other industrial revolution, and this is not new, again, and I'm really, I really like your line of dispel the fear. Imagine the guys who are using the pen when the printing press came. Imagine. Those guys who are using those things, eh? you know, the quill feathers. And then all of a sudden the printing press came. Wasn't it the same? So this is not new. Like any other industrial revolution, it is the same. 
you will lose jobs, but more will be created. Right now, about 77 million will be lost. 133 million more will be created. To your point, which side will you be? Again, skilling, reskilling, upskilling. You have to be future ready. So let me just start with that. Um, other big things, I'll not touch copyright. Copyright you talk about is as a risk. <laughs> the biggest risk I think for me is ethic, ethics, ethical considerations. That's what I see as one of the big ones. And then bias. Uh, because you can weaponize AI very easily right now. To produce a film, to produce a, a piece around audio is very easy. You do not need big studios. I can easily write a story about Onditi and paint him as a terrorist. With no filters and I have a distribution channel, I'll just put it out there. How do we mitigate against these types of things? I think for me that's the biggest, biggest risk, right? Because it's easy to generate content and reinforce a stereotype and just and we've seen it. So to your point on misinformation, disinformation, deep fakes and fake news is that ability right now with a simple smartphone, anybody can just produce content. So I think for me, that's a big one. The second one is, and I know you've mentioned it, data privacy and data security. I don't want to go there. But where I really want to spend some time on, and this is my final point, is that this whole issue around human agency and this is a risk we are not necessarily seeing because the more you start to rely, to your point, that somebody even had to use uh, GPT to do like a speech, I'm sure GPT updates all your LinkedIn posts, I see them, I can just see GPT has updated it, you see they're laughing. But, but this whole ag issue of agency, human agency, like even the simple things that you would do as a human being, you're delegating it to a to, to, to an AI, I think we need to be careful. It's not to do everything. And we shouldn't lose agency. And over time, we will we lose our agency. But the other piece around agency is cultures are disappearing, especially around data. So it means them, if I have compute, if I have capability of building um, a language model or a training model, those who don't have, over time, will disappear. Prompting right now is the search engine, right? So imagine you don't have a Google or a Bing anymore, that the prompt is your point. So it means cultures that are online are the ones that we have. So I think we have to be careful. But also I think that's also work for you as creators is how do we use AI to begin to build more content from communities and your languages that are not online. So I see that as sort of the kind of duality of AI. It's a problem, but it could be a serious opportunity for, for our cultures. Thank you. Um, you've touched on the next area where we're going to go into, which was ethical considerations, and then we were to close with future prospects, which is good because that was the conversation. Deep fakes, biases, all these things. I think you've painted a good picture, and I'd like for Liz and Joel to kind of like bring it home to the level of that high school graduate to understand why ethical considerations are important, whether you are a producer or a consumer. So I'll start with Joel and then I'll come to you, Liz. Check. All right, good. Yeah, so um, a really, really big part of, of AI is ethical considerations. And uh, it's re responsible use of AI, number one and then ethical use of AI. And I think safety also comes in under that aspect. So we are producing human-like you know, uh, utilities. We're producing items that can do what human beings can do. So it's really good to think of it as I'm producing a human being. I like giving the example of a parent. I don't know how many of us are parents here, but I'm a parent. When you're a parent, part of your work is to raise your kid right. Right? That is the ethical consideration. Because I'm raising a human being, I want them to be disciplined, I want them to be able to listen, to not talk back at, 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 at grown-ups, you no know, things like that. Right? So I compare it with that, because we are producing AI, or we are using AI. You use, AI is like a human, just like Philip explained. It's a machine doing what humans do. And, and I'm going to give a, a, a simple example 
uh, maybe a couple of examples. You know, one, we have bias in AI. For example, if I produce an AI that is biased, you know, that becomes a challenge. There's a story in the US where some AI uh, bot or whatever video used would see black people and automatically say that there could be maybe their thugs or their, you know, you know, they are uh, not good people. That's bias, right? Uh, uh, we did a project a couple of months back with Red Cross where we were building an AI chatbot that was for the gender-based violence community. And the goal of the chatbot was very noble. It was, you know, somebody can log in, talk, and say, I'm in trouble, my husband is doing this, my wife is doing whatever. And in a very smart way, using open AI, they would get feedback from this bot. Then something came up and someone said, look, this AI is targeting a very, very delicate audience. What if somebody goes and says, look, I'm done, I'm being abused, what is the quickest way to kill myself? Does the AI also, again, because it's smart, does it give them the quickest way to kill themselves? You know. So again, we are producing near humans whenever, from a producer perspective, and producer I mean, uh, we develop AI models. So we need to think about the interaction that this particular um, utility has with people and what people use it for. So in the film industry, what are the challenges? You know, copyright issues, you know, the deep fakes. So as we are leveraging this AI, those are the items we need to be thinking about. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. All right, so I'll answer this as I'm also answering the question on challenges. Because they kind of, from a legal perspective, they, they lap, you know, overlap each other. Um, so of course there's a copyright and IP dilemma. Clearing rights in the digital space can be a nightmare, right? Because how do you know who is the right author? I'm going to reach out to someone via an email. How do I know this is the right person? Because we acknowledge already that I have to clear the rights from the rightful owner. So now, that's one of those challenges. Because if you're already cognizant that there is, um, you know, what I can see has so-and-so's so fingerprint, it's likely to be so-and-so's work, how do I um, sort of clear that to use? So the copyright clearance issues there are quite, you know, murky. But at the same time, you know, yes, we're saying, you know, some are saying we don't need regulation, but I feel like there are, there are some things we could sprinkle in different acts. So like in the Copyright Act, we have what is called digital rights management information. This is the info that you have that identifies your content online. So what does that look like now in the context of AI? How can we make it stronger in the Copyright Act so that it's easy to identify this content? What does that DRM look like? Or can we obligate these systems to have that as a feature? So that when I create, I can find my content. You know, like things like that. Because the clearance issues is a, is a big deal. Um, you know, the data issues have been talked about. Again, you know, it also seeps into how it can also feed into matters, crime and whatnot. So again, there's a whole situation that in terms of uses. Because now look like uh, in Kenya, we are known for this conning and scam culture. So you can imagine if I take a voice from your film and then I dupe someone, I know, you know, let's say Wangeshi is a fan of Idris Elba. And then I call her. <laughs> and she can hear this is Idris's voice. Idris knows that she's in film, and she says, I'm, "He says I'm in town. I'm I'm just coming in from LA." <laughs> you know all these things. So again, the, the issue of just uses and how do we protect consumers is a whole other situation. And and looking at how it cuts across even different industries from consumer, you know, from fast moving consumer goods and whatnot, it's a whole situation. So again, looking at even standardization. Is that an issue? How do we, you know, consumer protection generally? And then something else, when I was reading also how Tyler Perry's opinion of Sora and how he has thought about it, and he brought some interesting concerns that even I saw from um, a legal perspective. Kenya Film Commission is marketing Kenya as an ultimate filming destination. Now, here is Sora that can actually take me to the Alps or to Mount Kenya without leaving. What does that mean for us as Kenya Film Commission, as Kenya in general? Again, that means we have to start thinking about either regulations or um, principles that we want to think through to make it easier and, and make sure that we are not cut off the, of the ecosystem or the equation. Because yes, if I use Sora and now I am shooting in, in Mount Kenya, 
I didn't pass by Kenya Film Commission. I didn't pass by KFCB, you know. So again, there, there are interesting things to think about. Um, some proactivity in terms of also on a management level, in, you know, when KFC is doing their con you know, negotiations or whatever, marketing us. You know, what, what then are some of those considerations that they want to have to make sure that we don't lose out? Um, in terms of job loss, I think we've really focused a lot on the editors. But now, Sora can actually now um, do makeup, like um, change all the, um, the, the appearance, right? So like one of, for me, one of the jobs that I have seen, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's the makeup guys. So as, as uh, Philip has been speaking and Joel has been speaking and, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm trying to see how for the makeup guys, because <laughs> already we're using it on, on social media, on, on IG and everything nowadays. You know, if I want to do, yeah, I just do the filter and I have a nice video and guys think I did makeup. The only thing that, you know, sells me out is at the bottom because copyright moral rights at the bottom, it will say which filter I use. That's the only thing that sells me out. But otherwise, I'd be asking you, I'd be asking a fellow chick, oh, what makeup did you use? So that's one job skill that, you know, question mark, right? But at the same time, we, we said this is human, humans are feeding into this system. So there's a possibility that, you know, thinking devil's advocate, thinking many steps ahead, right? There might be a situation where we will have a situation where the AI may to an extent be at 80%. If it's at 80%, it means many people are out of jobs, yeah? So that means then we need to also think about policies that complement, right? Um, so it's such that you're saying, as you use this uh, technology, make sure that you're still using Kenyan labor, you're still doing this, like so that then we, we don't find ourselves when you're at that 80% and now we're being reactionary sort of thing. Yeah, so those would be my comments. Thank you, Liz. Um, wow. Skill? That is your new song. And I think we've talked about the challenges and the ethical considerations. At this point, I'd like for Jacques and Joel, just the two of them, to talk about future prospects. And future prospects will bring us to the point that we'll now review some of the questions that you've posted, and that will be asked for today. So in terms of future prospects, look at it this way. How does it create more jobs in reality? How does it make life improve our quality of life? And how does it bring about economic development in the film industry? Thank you. OK, so that's, and I see the last question is exactly the point of this discussion. NFT was a hype, and now it's gone. So AI will be a hype too, but NFT and AI are two different things. NFT was a, a picture <clears throat> that was sold to rich people, wanted to say, oh, I have the NFT. Uh, the, 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 the most famous one was uh, the monkeys, you know, they had a collection of monkeys. So people were buying $1 million a picture with their name on it, so that, that, were, that was their property. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, that cannot last. AI, like Philip said, it's a way of life. So it, it, it ca we cannot compare NFT and AI, but it's a very good question. So about creating jobs. Um, 20 years ago, machine translation came on the market. So like Philip was talking about the pen and the, and the printers, same concept. So translator, we were using a lot of translator to localize any content, not only film, but anything. And machine translation came. So machine translation as a memory. So this, is, this was a kind of AI. So machine translation, and everybody panicked, and all the translators said, that's it, we lost the job. Well, I can tell you, being part of a huge localization company, but we are still looking for translators. We don't have enough translators. Even with machine translation, we don't have enough translators. Why? Because machine translation, like I said, AI doesn't think, doesn't feel, is, can calculate, can have a great memory, can remember thousands of words in one second, but this is not creative. This is not decision making. So. Machine translation is going to do the first draft of a translation. We all experience Google translation. But after that, a new job appeared. Proofreader. 
the proofreader did not exist before because the translator was doing the job and proofread their own, their own work. But now the machine is doing the first job and the second job appear, ma uh, proofreader of machine translation. And I can go on and on and on like that because every time there is a new tool, there is a new use that we didn't think about before. And a new generation, a new, uh, a new work is going to emerge. Like you take uh, internet, you take TikTok, okay? 15 years ago, did we know what was an influencer? I didn't know. I didn't even know the word influencer. Now you have influencer, you have new jobs. And I'm always complaining with my wife about my daughter, which is 16 year old, always on the telephone <laughs> watching TikTok. I say, this is not good, this is not good. And my wife is telling me, no, don't worry. Maybe she will become an influencer <laughs> and she will be rich. So, you know, this is what AI is going to propose to us. New job and the most important thing is we don't even know what the jobs are. Thank you. That is very profound. Jo well, it's so profound. I don't know what to say after that because, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so spot on because you think about, think about the computer revolution when computers came, right? And, and there was the same discussions, you know, oh, computers, will they take over? Oh, not, it's not going to work. Now, think of where we are today because of computers. Think of software developers. Think of influencers, right? Because of the phones, right? Just think of what is, you know, has come as a result of the, I mean, AI is in the same boat. Right now, we don't even know what is going to come out. Honestly, we don't know. But one thing we know for sure is that this thing is going to disrupt the world in a very big way. And you can't compare it to NFTs. NFTs was a feel-good aspect. You know, somebody bought the NFT of, uh, what was Twitter's founder, the name I forget, of his first tweet. Jack, Jack, yeah? You know, the first tweet that he tweeted out, I'm buying that NFT. I mean, that is nothing, you know? AI right now is here and it's here to stay. Let me tell you, if 10 people right now are, are in a room doing film editing, video editing, using AI, we might require only two people. That is something. That's not an NFT. That is something. So part of what we're doing actually is becoming creators of this AI. Somebody mentioned um, using AI tools maybe, maybe to locate, to, 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 um, to shoot in certain places without having to fly there. But jobs could come out of that. Could we be the ones probably taking pictures of that place that then are copyrighted, that can be used within the AI tools? Could we be the ones maybe building those particular AI tools to be used in the film industry? So currently part of what we're doing at Pathways, for example, with the government, we're working with Konza Technopolis, is we are training AI developers. We're training experts who are able to build these AI models. And, and our goal, and kudos to the government of Kenya, is to train about 30,000 developers, of course across various industries, to be the ones to train these AI models, because we want to create those models. But that is only a tip of the iceberg. I, all I can say is I don't know what jobs are going to be created, but trust me, this thing is revolutionary, it's a disruptor, but jobs are going to be created. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I will, for the remaining part, I'd like us to review the questions that were posted so that we can get a general theme about what people still want to learn and then my panelists will be kind enough to respond. Christine, if you could scroll up from the first responses and then we sort of get a feel of what is this space that people still... Go up. Okay, so we've got... <laughs> this gentleman says, why can't people do things manually instead of using AI? In Amaliza Kazi Bon. I think that has been responded to, but thank you for alarming us. Uh, Brian, don't be scared. Just find a way to find yourself using the toolbox. Uh, photographer says, are there any ethical considerations, especially transparency to audiences that we should keep in mind? I believe we spoke about ethical considerations just now. 
So your answer was already in the second last part of our conversation. Keep going, keep going. Uh, is there sufficient knowledge in Kenya in copyright? I think that was answered by Liz. Keep going. Uh, Tito from Mombasa is saying, what are the potential ethical implications? We've discussed this uh, with deep fakes. We discussed that when we were doing the... I think you're going in the wrong direction. Uh, keep going, keep going. Down. Uh, okay, so... This we discussed in the beginning, how it will improve efficiency. Um, it's all about efficiency. You don't need to use Excel and so many other softwares, one thing will do. Considering the fact that we don't really know the full capabilities of AI, since it keeps evolving, do you think we're just an informed denial that it might actually be a threat? Philip, please speak to this one. I think we've mentioned it, right? So if, if you think about it, again, I go into the definition of artificial intelligence, right? It's, it's simply machines being able to to do what humans can do. And as I said, artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor intelligent. It's coming from humans. So we are not deniers, and that's why I think this panel has been talking about ethics. We're talking about guardrails. When we talk about governance, of course, we may be in the fence around regulation. My issue is that because it's changing very fast, if you regulate it today, tomorrow it has changed. So governance for me is the other piece. And part of the governance we're talking about globally, to your point to say that we're not deniers, is, is the governance model we're looking for is, uh, is governance that evolves. Is how do you ensure that you do not stifle innovation, which means you still need to continue to work, make money, but then do no harm. That, that even that way of using AI is still within the law, right? And has guardrails. Thank you. Um, facing pit actors, this... Is some, this is, you know, we're in, we're in business. In the business we're in is a business of supply and demand. If the client feels like they want to use generative AI, there's nothing you can do about that. However, you can find a way within that performing arts space to use AI to open up better opportunities for yourself. Tito from Mombasa, we, we read about this. Keep going. Uh, what opportunities the AI present to enhance special effects and visual storytelling? We spoke about enhancing production quality earlier. Uh, how can filmmakers balance the use of AI technology with traditional filmmaking techniques? I think Jacques spoke to this, and this is where the term toolbox came from. It's a toolbox to do that. AI creates from derivative works data given to it by people. How will a person make sure that the data was cleared? I think Liz spoke to this when she offered me money. Uh, if you remember, it was at that time. <laughs> Continue. Uh, given the negative influence of Cambridge Analytica had on our politics, uh -huh. how can the journalism sector protect itself from the freshest use of AI, e.g. fake videos? I think Philip spoke about extended uh, responsibility to the companies that produce AI. That is the place where we can be able to do this. As they train the AI, as these companies roll out products, they must have thought about such things. What role do you see AI playing in distribution and marketing of films, especially in terms of personalized recommendations and audience engagement? We spoke about audience development, and we said it's creating a new path. Where to? It's the same way you will use your editing software, your writing software. It's just a tool. So there's somebody behind AI who will have that. Masai, filmmaker in the future. <laughs> Interesting title. AI will create a whole movie real time for a user via accumulated data to cater for the users once at that moment. This renders creatives pointless. Can we stop it? That anxiety, I think, for the 90 minutes we've spoken today, clearly we would agree that it's not about stopping or getting afraid. It's about seeing this toolbox. Minataka kuitumia juyagari ama chiniagari ama kando. Sasa, Mary Death Bell, Africa editor, Hollywood Week. With the ever-evolving technology, I am concerned about the need for continuing education of legislators charged with regulating something they don't understand. Philip. No, I totally agree. Uh, because I think about the same way uh, technology and artificial intelligence is disrupting us, it's also disrupting policy making. And so this is why I didn't want to use heavy words. We are calling it agile governance. Agile governance means that even policymakers right now need to understand that 
this linear way of passing regulations does not capture the moment and you increasingly become obsolete. So the same skilling, reskilling, upskilling we are talking to you is the same way we are also talking to policy makers. That they need to adopt other methods of, of, of governance. Meredith, we are in full agreement. Faith, my question is why do we need AI as filmmakers is pure when we add some AI? The value the film has may be lost. Why do we have to support AI when we have a brain? Again, your brain will work to think and do all these things, but you will need some tools to increase your in outputs and improve your efficiency. Think about AI like that, Faith. AI gives the audience an ability to choose the way they want to experience a film. That's true. Does this mean in the near future one can have an ending? It is already there. It's not in the near future. There are films that are called interactive films where you get in and you get to choose the path of the story that you want to follow. So that is already here. Isn't AI a limitation to upcoming filmmakers, especially those trying to get into the industry? A big opportunity, Origi. A huge, huge opportunity. Carry on. How might AI impact the role of directors, writers, and other traditional creatives in the process? This question goes to Philip. But I believe that question we answered earlier. Again, I'm going to the tool. If I'm a director, why would I need to draw a storyboard while I can feed that information and I have my storyboard tomorrow? I don't need to wait for 28 days for the storyboard artist. And the storyboard artist will need an AI tool to reduce that time period. Let's start thinking that way, okay? Considering copyright issues that may be percolated by data with an AI company, be held responsible for legal defilement. Okay, the term defilement uh, is a bit... Uh, however, Liz addressed that and they said, go to the fine print and it is a jungle, as Jack said earlier. Mr. Jack has clearly defined that AI can't quite take over the acting industry since acting requires movements and feelings, not capability with AI, but what about print and script practice? Same thing we said earlier, it's a tool to increase efficiency and make you work better. Are materials like storyboard created by AI authentic? How are we able to take advantage of the tool? I've just spoken about this right now. If it's possible, choosing a personal ending will then limit creativity of the filmmaker. Actually, it challenges you more because you're making a film with possibilities. Okay? Looking ahead, what are emerging trends and developments? AI, this was our final conversation when we spoke about future prospects. And I believe Jacques and... Uh, Joel unpacked it well. Isn't the anticipation of the movie, like not knowing what will happen in the end, makes the movie, you still have that option, it's not taken away. You can watch the film if you don't want to watch it interactively. So interactive films are made in a way you can consume it linear or you can consume it in an interactive way. Can we have filmmakers behind the making of AI for creatives or rather are the creatives behind the making of AI? I will challenge Joel as they're providing solutions to also now think of how to include the film industry and the creative industries in general in the solutions they're providing to still tell, to make the story be human so that you're not having the situation that Joel described here when somebody greeted people as the late, but they were all alive. Uh, what are some of the potential risks or unintended consequences of widespread AI adoption in the film industry and how can this be mitigated? We spent some time on challenges before we went into ethical uh, considerations. This thing is being streamed on HBTV, so if you need to go on the YouTube link, rewind, you can replay this, that answer was particularly unpacked. I use ChatGPT to ask this, how, how can writers keep AI from turning their masterpieces into prose <laughs> with plagiarism balls and biased brains, all while maintaining the genuine creativity? I think Jack, you spoke to this? Yes. So I'll ask you to review the video today. You, this answer is there. Uh, can the creation of Nightshade program by artists to poison AI be justified? Hmm. Jack, what would you say to this? Mic check. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so that's what we were talking about earlier. Uh, 
the good use of AI and the good use of data. People are going to want to uh, make the uh, system go bad because they have personal interests. Uh, you know, everybody or a lot of people uh, are, are, are scared of the chaos. But some people want to create chaos. That's happened in all the society and all the civilization since uh, our uh, ancestors. So we have to be very careful about that. And besides the opportunity, this is a real threat. So the filmmakers need to be the creative decision maker of their movies. So. Uh, AI is going to enhance their way of thinking. They are going to uh, um, multiply their uh, creativity. But content is so easy to use now. Uh, Liz was talking about that earlier. I want to take a voice and make it sound like somebody else or creating fake news. I just click on my internet, my Google, my uh, Safari, whatever, and you have a lot of data that is there, at your disposal. So Liz was absolutely right about it. It's not because it's in the internet that you can use it, but I think that's a problem. You, we need to keep the creativity. We are the decision maker. The machine is just at our service. Thank you. No, I think that the program, I think for me, was very much the fear from Hollywood, right? So they wanted to find a way to counteract. Um, sort of AI influence into Hollywood, but you've seen there's been negotiations around it. But that's why I was talking about governance. Nightshade is not necessarily interfering with the core of the large language model, so I don't see it necessarily as a problem, but basically speaks to the fact that we needed a, a, a better way to deal with that problem. And so, and that's why I keep on talking about governance and not necessarily specific actors trying to also get a tool to counter another tool. Thank you. Remember, artificial intelligence, it's not artificial and it's not? Keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> Brian, your question was answered sufficiently, uh, generated by AI. Where does a filmmaker stand when AI has evolved enough to make full film productions by itself, most likely in less than 10 years to come? I would challenge the person who wrote this to make this a personal thesis, to understand and provide the answers and the solutions so that we don't end up in that place. Won't you want to use AI? Won't the use of AI alter our creativity, especially for our future generations? I think it will improve how they create and how they think and not alter. Because creativity is not something that's objective. You you cannot box it in a place and say you can alter it. Contract clause. The producer can may shall use your image and likeness. Does this give the producer the right to create derivatives? using AI without one consent, done. The lovely Liz will speak to this for the last time today. Please. Yes, and I think we must. We, we really must. Um, so no, you cannot use those blanket clauses, number one. You cannot use may, shall, we, la, la. Decide what you want. Decide how you want it. Yeah? And ensure that that consent has been given freely, that they understood. Yeah? Because at the end of the day, unfortunately, there will be also the data, that data protection intersection that plays with, with copyright. That question will come. So you better get that clause drafted well, that the data subject has understood that clause. And, and now what we're doing even, because the way they say under the Data Protection Act that uh, when you're seeking consent, it will not hurt uh, on that clause to also add an extra dash where the subject will sign expressly that they understood and they consented but again refrain from using perpetuity because that one will come back to court or the tribunal and will be, it will be adjudicated but be clear what you want how you want it when you want it thank you Ms. Kiyo, sawa, sawa, go. is there a chance that we can wake up one day and ai in the film industry is gone who knows about tomorrow but technology is here to stay and i keep telling my filmmakers every day the more you interact with technology, connect with it, understand it, see how it can create opportunities for you. Next, please. Brian Sanare, photographer and filmmaker, are there any ethical considerations 
For filmmakers who keep in mind when utilizing AI, we spoke about ethical considerations quite con And if you missed the session, just go to HBTV streaming, you'll find the session. NFTs, we spoke to this. Uh, keep going. Uh, Kajiki here, how do we consider collaboration work with AI as a creative work? We spoke about this in the mid session. Amos generated by 3.5. What role do you envision AI playing in personalized content creation and distribution in the film industry? We spoke about this when I was telling you about uh, the opportunities to use AI and develop immersive experiences for audiences and to develop curated uh, from the same content. You could develop derivative works and dish it out in AR, in VR, and in other forms. As president of KFTPA, what actions are the organization taking in engaging lawmakers in Kenya to safeguard creatives borrowing heavily from the EU and Hollywood? I am the president, but I'll let <laughs> Philip to speak to this. Thank you. <laughs> And I think it's because the process is ongoing right now. Uh, so we're in the process of developing an AI strategy. So definitely we're going to reach out uh, to everybody, including Mr. President here. <laughs> Thank but you. Next, please. Uh, alternative ending for films. Is there already happening? If yes, no. Nah. This was nicely tackled, Scholar. Next. Uh, what are the ethical responsibilities? This was tackled, please. Uh, my concern is how AI is isn't in the work of editors. This we spoke about quite, quite. AI is a game charm. I think Mambo Ilisha, Pokueka, Gina, H. This is in French. This is in French, so I will let Jack uh, interpret for us. Uh, so, um, Mr. Jack, this is a pleasure to listen to you and uh, have a light on certain elements. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> but uh, can you uh, give us uh, a few minutes for an interview? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the last question, what ethical considerations? Uh, we spoke about ethical considerations. Ladies and gentlemen. I hope we have been of value for the 90 minutes you have given us. And if we have, kindly, please give my panelists a hearty round of applause. Thank you. Before we leave, before we leave, because we're in the presence of only one lady, she's the only one who will do closing remarks. And after that, we shall pose for some pictures and leave. But please, thank you so much for paying attention. And I hope in so many ways we have inspired you, we have given you knowledge and we have reduced your anxiety. Asante Nisan. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so the reason I just want to make some remarks is because um, as Kenyans, as creatives, we're always afraid of the law. We're afraid of dispute resolution. I'm the chairperson of the Copyright Tribunal. I'm basically telling you we have a tribunal specifically dedicated to copyright issues. The best part about a, a tribunal and our tribunal is that, one, you can represent yourself. You come as you are. Okay, there's no formality. I don't need you to, we don't need you to know the civil procedure code. You're not a lawyer. What matters is that during your creative process, you had your evidence with you. So that, for example, if you were removed from a deal or even from a registration of a copyright and you were a co-author, who do you come to? You come to us, right? If a deal has, you know, gone through with a distributor, you were left out of it and you are rights holder, you can come to us. It is affordable. You will barely spend 5,000 bob for the whole process. Barely. And the turnaround time is the best part. Within a maximum of 60 days, you have a judgment. We have a booth um, just near the Dorman's um, uh, cafe. So come and know more about us. But if you want to move us, our email is copyright at court.go.ke. I'm sure you'd hap you're happy to know that you can save your real money you won't eat it with lawyers and come and <laughs> represent your dispute. But please come and know more. Embrace disputes. We can help you, dis you know, resolve your disputes faster, friendlier, and in an affordable way. So thank you. Thank you. And with that, we shall go back to One Love as we take our pictures. Thank you. Asante Nisana. My coffee, man. An absolutely amazing conversation right there. Another round of applause for them, Tafavali.
of course, just demystifying that from all angles, governance when it comes to the actual craft of it, and of course also looking into how we can leverage some of the opportunities even in the unknown. As always, it's good when we all smile for the camera. Fantastic stuff. Thank you so much. Are we good? Photo-wise? Fantastic. Thank you so much. As they exit, of course, uh, the use of AI and the opportunity and welcome to the opening ceremony of the Kalasha International Film and TV Market Festival and Awards 2024. We have the market where we discuss the business end of film and TV, how it actually makes money, makes sense. We're also going to be having the festival where you can actually enjoy those amazing productions and they've been curated for you to watch right across the city. I'm excited to be here, Jeff, and I'm expecting a lot of networking and um, finding collaborations and partnerships with industry stakeholders here and of course um, making new friends and learning a lot from the panel discussions and the workshops. Today is dedicated to our film industry and the entire ecosystem geared towards having fruitful outcomes as we kickstart this market. The government is committed to supporting and nurturing film industry, recognizing the economic, social and cultural significance. We are proud of strides that we have achieved thus far and believe that we are destined to make more strides as we progress in developing the local film industry and connecting to the world at large. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are glad to have you. I've already mentioned that we have quite a menu for all of us. In the course of the three, four days of being around the city, find time to uh, savour, to taste what the beautiful country and the beautiful city has to offer. The first trend we have noticed is partnerships. A long time ago we used to say, you know, that company, that one, multi-choice, they are our enemies. We no longer can define our enemies. There are no more enemies. The person who actually determines who an enemy is, is yourself. Our expectations is to also be part of learning in the Kalasha film and TV market because we are students ourselves and we want to make these connections because we are right in the heart of the industry as we enjoy the very good productions that have been made here in Kenya. As a government, we are committed to supporting and nurturing the film sector and we recognize its economic, social and cultural significance. We understand the importance of providing filmmakers with the resources, infrastructure, and opportunities they need to thrive. And in the spirit of collaboration, ladies and gentlemen, we invite filmmakers and the media professionals from across the globe to forge partnerships, share ideas, and explore new possibilities. Let this film market and the festive serve as a platform of dialogue, innovation, and inspiration. Thank you so much. And with that, the PS declares the Kalasha market officially opened. Thank you. When you talk about sustainable and independent filmmaking, we know the barrier to entries have been brought down. And today, we will discuss, delve into this particular session. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, all of us will have figured out some ways that we can solve these emerging challenges that touch on independent filmmaking. We first of all need to know the market. Why are we filming and how can we 
gain money from uh, the, uh, the the product we are involving in, and it is the job of the producers to know and understand in the market. If you want to go beyond borders, research is in, is key. You have to research global trends as well as local trends. If you're an indie filmmaker, what, what are some of these challenges that we face? There's a lack of like a kind of consolidated effort on an educational level that aligns this, our aspirations. It may look uh, easy or, or tough, but again, as long as you believe in yourself that you have that structure that you have to, sh to tell your stories, Anyone can do it. Anyone can tell this kind of story. You just need to come to Africa and see how things work and how people are here. And for indie cinema, indie films, people, it is quite easy for us to tell this kind of story and it will sell in China. Which other avenues should indies filmmakers explore to to make returns on investment. How can you advise such a person who has a story, maybe has excellent actors, but does not know where to start? We as Africans know that we have to be ingenious in how we engage and relate and figure out our way. So we need to believe that we can figure out that way. Now we should start thinking about self-distribution. Then the next step, distributors will come after you. What is the place of a business plan for an independent filmmaker? And do you ever have an end in mind at any given time you are coming up with your story? So how can you make a business case as a filmmaker to anyone to say that this is um, an investment? You don't have an audience. And then we're always looking outside. We're saying, you know, like uh, Mr. Soko said, you know, grow your audience in Africa and in the diaspora. But what about in Kenya? Passion and love for stories does not put food on the table, as we know. And it's been a major concern. It's come up a number of times in this room. So, yes, we also do it for the money. But what industry doesn't? Show them that this is what I can do as a, as a cinematographer. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting into the last conversation of the evening. We've had a lot of nuts and bolts talk about, you know, film infrastructure, investment, talking about AI, but there's an issue that hasn't been touched on, and this is the time we talk about mental health in the space that we're in, the anxiety that comes with being creative every single time, juggling the business and the books on the other hand, and how you make sure both of them move as they should. That's a discussion happening next, of course, also totally engaging, so if you have any questions, please feel free to forward them to the panel as they get into that. And for that particular discussion, it will be led by Ms. Eunice Omolo. She's a health and science journalist, has covered very many stories, both in print and electronic media. So put your hands together for the moderator, Ms. Omolo, as she takes us through mental health. Eunice, the floor is yours. Or probably she was waiting for a bigger applause for her to come up from backstage. So can you have a round of applause for our moderator, please? Told you. 
Something she was waiting for. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Uni Somolo. Uh, as it said, science and health journalist, award-winning journalist. And also, other than that, I've lived with bipolar for 17 years, since I was a teenager. So, matters of mental health, uh, being in the writing industry, is something I'm passionate about. And without wasting time, I'd like to introduce uh, my panelists who are going to help me, you know, delve more, talk about it, uh, see how we can share, how we can interact, and uh, possibly find solutions and uh, recommendations. And uh, part of the panelists, you're also going to be part of it as well, because you're going to help us ask questions and also give your recommendations, give your suggestions. And if you have a story that you want to share as well, uh, you can give it to us so that we can also highlight and talk about it. So without wasting time, my first guest is Gadoni Mbugwa, who is a clinical psychologist. Gadoni Mbugwa. Please welcome her. I'm a coffee. Welcome, Gadoni. Have a seat. He'll also tell you more about herself, but I'll introduce the rest. I'll bring in the rest first. Then next, we're going to have Liz Njenga. Liz Njenga is a counselor, marriage and family therapist. Please welcome Liz Njenga. Karibu. Next, we have Dr. Ruth Lucinde. She's a clinical epidemiologist and mental health practitioner. Please welcome Ruth. Tafadali Makofizenyu. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. So beautiful. Then I'm uh, going to introduce our next panelist, Wedera Karen. She works with MPRSK, MMSK, Strategy Head of Communications. Tafadali, welcome, Wedera Karen. <laughs> so we were supposed to have Nini Washira, but because of uh, unavailable circumstances, she can't be with us, but uh, the discussion still goes on. So Tafadalini, Asanteni, and uh, Morembo, welcome. Yes. So I'd want each and every one of you, starting from Daktari, to introduce yourself, give us more about yourself, and uh, what do you expect to learn, or what do you expect the audience is going to get from you? Right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Gadon Mbogwa. Thank you, Eunice, um, and my fellow panelists. I'm truly, truly excited to be here today. Um, mental health and mental wellness is my forte. So I'm a clinical psychologist and a certified wellness therapist. I'm the head of digital relations at Chiroma Hospital Group. And I'm also the clinical psychologist in charge at AR Hospital on Kiambu Road. I'm a trauma therapist, a mindset coach, uh, and above all the hats I wear, I'm a parent. That's my proudest hat. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, to take part in this conversation that is so highly stigmatized. We need to change that narrative. Yeah. Thank you so much. Next, please. Thank you, Eunice, and uh, good evening, or is it good afternoon? I'm excited to be here today. My name is uh, Liz Njenga. I'm a counselor and a marriage and family therapist, currently on private practice, and I deal a lot with couples and young adults and adolescents. I'm very excited to be here to have this conversation. Having worked uh, in the media for some years, about 10 years, and having left and joined the, this practice. So just looking back and uh, remembering how it used to be, I, I, I'm a mother of four children, and I think if I was still in the media, I don't know if I would have gone that far, <laughs> but uh, those are some of the things that made me leave the media, and I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a bad place to be or it's a place where you can't develop in family, 
but just I'm just here to really hold this conversation and see how can we help people in the media and in the in the film industry just live uh, their lives in 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 a way that uh, they are fulfilling their own calling and even the professional side of their lives is also growing. So thank you so much and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. Next. Thank you. My name is Dr. Ruth Lucinde. I'm a medical doctor and a clinical researcher and um, also a Melton Health uh, practitioner. My, so my research interests are in a lot of things, uh, adult infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases. But I've found myself really interested in, you know, mental health and how it intersects with other physical illnesses and even in our well-being and how we work. And one of the things that's very, very saddening is that we don't have a lot of data on how big a problem it is in our region. And it's one of the things that my current work and my future work really wants to bridge the gap on. So I'm very, very happy to be here. I'm very, very passionate about mental wellness and awareness. And, you know, this is a very good panel to be in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last but not least, Ms. Waidera. <laughs> Thank you so much. My name is Waidera Karen. I am an award-winning integrated marketing and communication specialist. I am also in the entertainment business, which is actually very, very, I will not say chaotic, but... Um, which is very fast. Yes. So this is a great panel. I really would like to just hear everything and everyone, and I would want to invite everybody to just be able to give, because mental health is just not in one sector, but just all-rounded. So I'm really excited to be here. Just before you put the mic down, you're going fast. So you've worked in the entertainment industry, and, uh, well, entertainment and media, and you know how it can be. Like, uh, you know. So what are some of these... Um, challenges, you know, that can drive people in the industry into a state where they cannot balance their mental health wellness, they cannot balance their professionalism, and how does this affect them? What are some of the challenges that really drive people into getting to that point? Okay, so I've ideally worked in agency for quite some time, and um, one of the key challenges that I know we face is in terms of working long hours and giving this project and just not feeling it um, being returned back. So these are one of the few things that just make people go into depression and just coping mechanisms such as alcohol and um, drugs and other things. And also just feeling, I think most time people just feel a lot being overworked and underpaid as well. So that is also one of the challenges. And also our, our industry is also a fun industry. It's an industry where every day you're interacting with alcohol, you're interacting with music, you're interacting with entertainers. So it's a very fast-paced world. And it's very easy to get lost into such a world. So those are just some of the things where people get to lose themselves, get to lose sight of what they're doing, where they're going. You find you're working so long, and the other time when you're not working, you're drinking. So you don't even have time for your personal self, for your personal growth, and any other thing. So those are just some of the few challenges. I would say a lot of it is just feeling overworked and not being appreciated enough, and just not having time for yourself. That would be key for agency and entertainment life. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, maybe I can ask, uh, what about... Uh Competition, we are seeing it a lot, you know, um, competition among uh, fellow artists, competition among fellow writers. Um, do you think this is also a contributing factor to that? And also another thing about society expectation, you know, and uh, now you have to compete with uh, what Wadira is wearing, what Wadira is driving, how many movies she's directing now. Do you think that is also a trigger to some of the mental conditions that we are seeing among Definitely, definitely. Everybody, I would think everybody or most people have um, a certain goal of where they want to be um, and at what time frame. And, you know, the world doesn't work like that. It may work for you. It may not work for you as well. So there's also that competition. You can, um, I would say also... Um, it can be very easy for a junior to get into some top position and now start leading um, older people, and that can also be a bit of stress. And also it can be, you feel like you've done this, you've done this, you've done so much work, I've put in so much effort, I've produced this, I've done these jobs, I've done these campaigns, but 
there's still no recognition for me. And my peers are going, you know, they're going to South Africa, they're going to this other country, they're getting these endorsements, they're getting promoted and whatnot, but I'm not moving. So this is actually, a competition is actually a key factor, I would say. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Rather, what are some of the most common mental health conditions or um, uh, symptoms that have been experienced, uh, mostly in the industry? And what are some of the triggers? And uh, why are we seeing them? Is there an increase? Is there a decrease? Are we seeing it more in men, in women, in young people? Um, thank you for that question. I'll, allow me to do a brief exercise. All right, I have a few questions that I would like just to engage you. And this is just to bring this conversation to uh, ground. How do things look like the, the reality uh, part of it? Okay. So, first of all, by a show of hands, how many of you have mental health? Just lift your hand if you have mental health. Okay, we have one. There's a hand behind. Two, three. This side, no. Okay. Now, please stand. I'm going to ask you a series of four questions. Um, the first three, if they apply to you, I want you to sit down. So, please, just bear with me. Please stand up. Yes. I also want my panelists to stand up. Okay. Just uh, so that we are not discriminating here. All right? So, if your neighbor is not standing, just help them. I'm not here to diagnose we are not here to give medication. This is just awareness, all right? So, and the reason why I want to do this is because of the question you've asked me in terms of uh, what do you need to look out for? Yes. Okay? So, if over the past two weeks you have had trouble with sleep, I want you to sit down. So, trouble with sleep looks like there are people who have trouble initiating sleep. <laughs> so, you'll go to bed... Um, 10, toss and turn, you're sleeping at midnight. Mm -hmm. Then there are those people, please don't sit because your friend is sitting, and then there are those people who sleep immediately, <laughs> but wake up, um, let's say, at 2 a.m., yeah. mm -hmm. and then they don't sleep until, until what time? Uh, around 5.30, that yeah. nice, it's really easy, right? But you know you can't really sleep. Yeah. And then there are those people you're asleep, but your brain is awake. You can hear everything that is going on um, around you. Okay? So if you're in any of those categories, sit down. The second one, if over the last two weeks, observably, either self-observation or through somebody next to you, if they have commented that your mood has changed. So you're either withdrawn. Yeah, you're not coming out for dinner, you're not going for classes if you're students, you don't want to go for work, or you're irritable, mm. observably, other people or yourself, okay? The third question, if you have had any stress, let me put a disclaimer, because this is very controversial, considering uh, where we are as a, as a country, mm -hmm. <laughs> however... If you've had stress with finances to an extent that you have not been able to sleep or eat well or your mood has completely been disrupted, have a seat. Now, the fourth question, mm -hmm. which is the last question, if over the last two weeks, if you have intentionally made time for exercise intentionally like it's not because you walked to the bus stop ah. no 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 Ama, you are zuru riding in town intentionally all right so first of all let's give a round of applause to the people standing <laughs> right and allow me to have a seat don't sit Goda. <laughs> If you can look at the demographic of the people who are standing, we have two men and we have three women, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So more often than not, when we do this exercise, when I do this exercise, you will always have more ladies standing than men. Yeah. Let's put that in a box. I'll come back to that conversation. Please have a seat. All right. So 
The reason why I like to ask that question, it's because when you're talking about mental health, when you're talking about mental illnesses, when you're talking about wellness, we usually imagine this is a conversation that belongs to some other guys, those guys who are in Chiromo or in Madare. But this is a good exercise to remind us that we are not an exception. What I have just told you today and what I have taught you is what we call the clinical red flags. There are actually six clinical red flags, but I can see we have people from school here, so I'll say five. Okay? Right? The first one is an interruption in sleep patterns, eating patterns, your mood, your bowels, and monthly periods for the ladies. Those are the clinical red flags. So if you want to do a brief check on yourself, those are the clinical red flags. Now, statistically, studies show that there is... When you look at um, the John Hopkins study, it says that specifically focusing on creatives, depression and bipolarism are usually the highest, yeah, in terms of the number of creatives who have um, mental illness diagnosis, okay? When you look at agility solutions, if you have a phone, you can just Google and look at that. It shows four out of five creatives actually report suffering from burnout, Four out of five. And some of the things Waidera has said, yeah, absolutely, are going to contribute to that. And one of the things I've experienced as a clinician, seeing a lot of people from the media industry, is the need, it's that, the creativity, you know that light bulb creativity. Yet patterns are changing every day. You wake up, content may change, you know, everything. The game has changed. So you're constantly trying to bat your head to see what's the next thing, what's the next thing. So there's a lot of burnout um, that individuals are suffering. What I found very, very interesting is that when we look at the WHO statistics, one in four people are likely to experience a mental illness in their lifetime. That's 25%, right? But when you look at the cohort of creatives only, do you know what is the percentage of people who are going to suffer from poor mental health? 71%. Oh. Imagine, 71%. That's quite high. like quite, quite high. And obviously... That's like 7 out of 10. Exactly. Okay. Why we need to have um, this conversation. Yeah. Wow. See why it's important. And still... At the tail of it, I'd want uh, Dr. Ruth, tell us about now the evolving trends, matters mental health in the creative industry. You know, we're talking about us. And then creative, I'm not just talking about the artists we see on film. Creatives, we have as young as teenagers, you know, on TikTok. We have young people less than 10 years old. Well, I see them on TikTok. And uh, we have young people over here. So there's that. Trends are changing in terms of content creation, in, in terms of artistry, in terms of creation. Now, juxtapose it to um, the revolution of mental health discussions, mental health um, awareness among the people. And at it, I want you to help us define the term awareness. We always talk about awareness. Yeah? So kindly expound and let us know. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a very loaded question and I'll try not to over discuss it. Yeah. But when we are thinking about the evolution of mental health in the film industry, we look at it in two ways. First, the film industry as a channel for promotion of mental health, but also the film industry as a, as a cause or as a perpetrator of mental illness. And we can start with uh, film industry as a channel for promotion of mental health. So I, I guess for globally, the um, the film industry started around the early 1900s. Um, and between then and maybe the 1960s, 1970s, characters depicted in film who have mental or who had mental illness were always portrayed as violent people, Adaras. social deviants, you know, crazy, um, and you know, people who have certain types of deformities that we cannot live with. Now, the thing with humanity is monkey see, monkey do. So whatever we see is what we do. And what happened is it really perpetuated the stigma um, around mental health and also this stereotyping about, around mental health. And then over the years, we get into this um, uh, industrial revolution, technological revolution. Um, in the 80s, 90s, we had a lot of um, you know, drug and substance abuse, which was widespread, especially in the West. 
And then again, um, the film industry would then sensationalize this. So you'd have um, maybe characters who are alcoholics. They are shown to, to really thrive in their alcoholism. Like a detective is an alcoholic, <laughs> but he solves all the cases. Yes. You know, you have this person who is, is in Wall Street and he's a, he's a financial analyst and he takes cocaine every day, but he makes the right decisions. And so we sensationalized drug abuse and substance abuse. And what happens is the industry also then um, allows its, its, um, its, I guess, actors or the people within it to be part of this world because it's what we're showing. Yeah. But the downside is when you become an actor who is now indulging in substance abuse, you're then shunned. So you're, you're difficult to work with yeah. or you're not fit for work. So then you're left outside with your device, uh, onto your devices. Now, in the early 2000s to around 2015, the, um, I think the conversation shifted. This time now, we had more depiction of me mental illness, but then it was considered something like a choice. So it's this character's choice to become an alcoholic. It's this character's choice to be depressed. It's this character's choice to want to die by suicide, which again is wrong because we know for some of this, generally for mental illness, it's not always a choice. But a very big shift happened in 2015. And the shift was that um, the World Health, Health Organization and the UN um, included mental health wellness in its sustainable development goals. And what that meant is globally, we have decided that mental health is a big deal and we want to address it. And so there's a change even in the film industry, such that now um, any productions that happened after that had proper depictions of mental health and mental illness. And um, you'd even now you'd even see normalization of men going to therapy, um, children talking about their trauma, etc. And as it's happening in the global West, it's also happening here locally. Um, I think if you're very keen, you've noticed that in the past few years, we've had a lot of um, um, work that's being put out on mental health. Recently, we had a documentary, I think, by Noelle on what eats my mind, and she's talking about her lived experiences in having bipolar mood disorder as someone in the film industry. And then recently, we also have um, a film, I think, something about love, um, um, that talks about postpartum depression um, by Charlene. Yeah. Yes. And so even here, we are trying to change the narrative. But then within the African context, context, and when you're thinking about film industry within the African context, you can forget culture. So think about Nollywood. You guys remember the first time you watched a Nollywood movie. If there was someone who had a mental illness, what was the cause? Witchcraft. Witchcraft. It was evil spirits or witchcraft. And that is what we have been watching over, through, uh, over the years. So again, for you as a person, whether you're in the film industry or not, the moment you start feeling like you're depressed, the first thing you'll wonder, have I been cast? Mm -hmm. is, is it something wrong to do with religion? You never once think of um, this could be an illness. And so again, after 2015, we saw the same shift in Nollywood. And there, there was collaboration between psychiatrists and psychologists and uh, filmmakers in trying to depict mental health the way it is. So where we are now, we are, there is a change. We are trying to um, portray mental wellness and mental health as it should be yeah. and promoting awareness. Now, while all this is happening, we have the technological revolution. So what happened from the early 2000s and specifically around 2012 is studies done showed that um, teenagers, adolescents, and young adults who spent a lot of time on social networking sites tended to have more depression and anxiety. And these are longitudinal studies, so these are people who are followed up over time. Now, while this is happening, we've also noticed that based on what is being portrayed in film or within the industry, it affects people's mental health. And I'll give you an example. There's a TV series on one of the popular streaming sites about um, a young girl who, I think it's called 13 Reasons Why, a yeah, young girl who was battling mental okay. illness, and it ends, um, the first season ends with her um, dying by suicide. Now, what happened is, in the United States, in the months following the airing of that episode, a lot of young 
people died by suicide the same way it was portrayed. It was like a copycat syndrome. Exactly. Uh-huh, okay. So even with technology and, you know, with, with access to all this information, there is effects we are seeing on, social, uh, on mental health. And, you know, still in technology, we know that technology is an avenue for um, people to get social anxiety. You know what we're talking about, competition, yeah. um, comparing yourself. There's a lot of information. You know, you might be reading something and maybe a, a person who's not a mental health pro- professional is talking about narcissists. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. decide that I have met this criteria. I am a narcissist. So there's an overflow of information and that's what we're dealing with now. Then now allow me to talk about the third aspect, which is the film industry as perpetuators of, of um, mental illness. For this, I'd like to give a story. So in January 2017, in London, um, the police were called by a very distressed gentleman. Okay. And he called them and he said, I would like you to go to this hotel to check on my partner because I'm not sure he's okay. They have better systems than here, so the cops went without asking for Kitukidogo. Um, <laughs> but what they found was that this, partner's, this person's partner was dead. He was in the bathtub and he was dead. Now, the reason the partner had called the police is two things. The previous day, his partner had sent him a message telling him he's reached the end of the road, and he had sent his colleague, who was... Um, a location manager, I think people in the film industry would know what that means, had um, texted his colleague and told him, my job is the loneliest job, and I hope that in the future you will make it easier for people like me to find help. So this story is very important because the person who died is called Michael Ham. He's a very famous uh, location manager and producer in the UK. He's worked on films like Pirates of the Caribbean, Harry Potter, and his death shook the the British film industry such that the government actually commissioned an industry-wide study to find out just how bad the problem is there. And so they talked to all the 9,000 people working in the film industry. And just to support what Gadoni had mentioned, so in their study they found that 9 out of 10 people working in the film industry in Britain had had a mental illness. 55%, almost more than half, had actually thought of dying by suicide or committing suicide during that year of the study. Of the people who were interviewed, 78% felt that their current working conditions were contributing to their mental um, illness. And finally, only 10% thought that their current working environment is um, is not very good, but is conducive for um, their mental wellness. It's really bad if you're here and you have a production company and only one out of 10 of your people think that you've given them an environment to, to be well mentally, it's not good. And so that caused a ripple effect across the industry globally. And, and so what's happened is now we have companies and we have um, industry players actually taking up the role to try and support the mental wellness of their people. But we don't have that data in Kenya. It doesn't help you as someone in the film industry in Kenya to know that nine out of 10 people in Britain have a mental disorder. We need to know what is the case and what the is the situation it. here, yes. And so awareness, coming back around, um, awareness, I would say, and uh, you know, don't quote me on this because I don't know the exact word, is just knowing and being, um, I don't want to say being aware, but just knowing what, what, it, what it means to be mentally well and what it means to be mentally unwell. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. That was an insight and uh, we've gone through history and I know we've learned a lot. I know some of you here have... Um, uh, your company, you know, creative companies and all that. And while they are continuing to talk, um, you can write down questions you want to ask, clarity that you want to get. But all I want us to know as we're walking through this journey uh, with the panelists, as uh, Liz is, uh, sorry, not Liz. Uh, yes, Liz. Liz is also going to take us through the process of accepting. We've already been told what to look out for, the red signs, you know, uh, the, the, the red flags on somebody, your partner, your colleague, what they are going through. And now the next part of this session, uh, it will be entirely about 
How do we resolve it? You've seen the red flags. You see your colleague has been drinking through and through, not showing up on set, not uh, writing the scripts the way they used to, they're not um, relating well with people, they are moody. And uh, Liz, I also hope you're going to take us through, uh, going back to what Waidera said, sometimes when you're in a set and the burnout is just crazy, there's a possibility that people in this crew are going to fight. So, Liz, you'd also help us understand, how do we understand the moods that are exhibited by our colleagues? How do we resolve such issues? But uh, before that, just take us through the effective way. The role of counseling and therapy. And I think I'll throw this question again to somebody who has a creative company. Do you do pre-counseling for your crew? Do you do post-counseling for your crew? I'll give a scenario, and I know she's going to expound more. You're doing a feature, or you do, no, you're doing a story or a documentary. A movie, yeah, let's say a movie. And the actor has to portray the role of a girl who was defiled when they were young. You know, they're defiled by their uncle. But unknowingly, you are casting. The person has never spoken about what they went through. Or somebody has to act like an alcoholic, okay? But truth is, the dad was an alcoholic who used to batter the mom. So, after a character, I just want to know from the industry, after a character or before a character has played this role, do you offer counseling services? Do you do follow-up to understand what some of the roles that um, the crew they are playing, if indeed it's affecting them? So that is the key part of the session right now, matters counseling, therapy, and then later on, uh, Dr. Ari, you're also going to help us about treatment how to seek treatment, where to get help, okay? So, throwing it back to you. Thank you. Uh, when you think about the film industry, brain power is one of the greatest assets. And so when you are thinking about uh, the production, I'm curious how many times we think about how you're going to support the crew and even the cast. And so that's where counseling and therapy comes in. And a lot of people, when they think about counseling and therapy, they think something must be wrong for me to go for counseling. From the questions that uh, Dr. Tari was asking here, many people started sitting from the first question. And, and, and a lot of times we think, why am I going for counseling? Just to talk. I can talk to my friends. Yeah, you can talk to your friends and your friends will sympathize with you. But when you come for therapy, we have very many mental, 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 mentally, mental health workers who are trained and skilled. And even as it's not just talking, it's therapeutic. And uh, they are able to connect with you and they're able to use interventions that will help you go through the challenges that you're going through. When you think about uh, some of the the, the, the stories that you give through the, the films, some of them are very emotive. At the end of the day, when you've finished your shooting and all that, is there a time you are able to sit in a safe space just to debrief mm. and unpack those emotions that were going through you, even as you did those, those, those scenes? So it's very important to, to even think of just having someone who, at the end of the day, can bring people together and help them to process the emotions. How about even the way you work with each other? Yeah, sometimes think about an onion. When you think of an onion, the outer skin is very dry and you don't even smell it as much as when you start peeling it off. The cast, the crew, everyone is like an onion. And you're spending so much time together and people are be beginning to come out and they begin to smell. You know, and the more they are coming out, the more they are smelling. And probably you are doing a, 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 a shoot for three months. By the end of those three months, people are thinking. The way you saw them when you first met is not the way you see them at the end. And the question is, how do we mitigate this? How do we take care of the crew? How do we take care of the cast? You know, think about uh, the way... Uh, if you're, if, if you're good, you, you're given a, a role to play, like she was saying. 
You know, sometimes these become triggers, you know, and, and, and maybe you have gone through something traumatic and you're supposed to go to, to, to do a scene that triggers those traumas. Who deals with that? How are you able to process that at the end of the day? You know? And, and how much do we care? Because it's, it's just ethical to care for one another. Yeah? You are together for so long, so long, together working. You leave your relationships at home. You come, you begin to build new relationships with your crew. And a lot of times, there are families that are made here, you know? And the question is, are there, are there, the, it's okay to have families here, but what are the boundaries? How are we able to help each other in, and have healthy connections with one another and still work together? So it is really important to address these issues in counseling. And, and just to know that, that uh, even as she talked about self-care, you know, when you come for counseling, you are able to engage on, on self-care. How do you take care of yourself? Sometimes maybe you took this role only because it was the only role to get you inside there. So what keeps you motivated? What keeps you motivated? Maybe you, you, you want to be a, a, a director, but you couldn't get uh, that position. The only position you could get is just miking people or, you know, mm -hmm. and not to mean that that is, a, that that is not important. But think about that person who has come in and what they are doing is not exactly what they want to do. So this can be very stressful, it can make you very anxious, and at the end of the day, the motivation is not there. So when you are able to talk through this, someone is able to help you go through it, finish the three months, and still be able to, to, to deal with everyday stresses and, and just manage yourself. And, and we, we, we like looking at self-care as, it's like a street fight, where everybody has to fight for themselves. And when you're talking self-care, it means you're saying yes to yourself and you're saying no to someone else. That's not easy. That means you're stepping on other people's toes. So it's, it's, it's really important to, to think about counseling so that we are not having people going for counseling and therapy when they are at the, at the very end, but through the process, from the beginning, from the time you are, you are, you are doing the auditions, you audition people, then you bring them, you want to know them, you let them do even personal therapy. Yeah, uh, like, like when we do the counseling course, the first thing you do is go for therapy sessions yourself. Yeah, so when you have even the cast and the crew doing counseling sessions just for personal therapy to just deal with issues that they are coming with, then it means that even your production and even the work they are doing will be satisfactory. So just looking at the whole process and making sure that this becomes a, a big part of this industry, that we are caring for the mental wellness. Because as they say, your, your health is your wealth. If you don't have, and we also say that without mental health, health there is no health. So if, if we are not healthy, then at the end, we will come, we do the production, we finish, and when we go, we hear something has happened or we really don't even know each other very well. So for me, I would say counseling and therapy really plays, plays a very key role in this industry. And I'm so glad that we are talking about this. And I believe going forward, there'll be changes. I'll throw it back to Edera. You're in the industry. You've worked with uh, creatives. Before we go back to Dr. Tari, uh, Liz has explained to us the importance of therapy, why we really need the therapy. Could you kindly paint the picture of exactly what really happens? The journey through uh, mental wellness in the workspace, and then why is it important? And then what should be done in terms of creating a safe space for people right before it gets worse for them to get to a point that now they have to skip Liz and go to Daktari, then after Daktari now they go to Liz. What are some of the steps that you can do so that you can create a safe working space within the industry? Um, so in terms, of, I, in terms of toxic workspaces, there's a lot that happens and ideally, you know, there's sabotage, there's um, competition, there's um, lack of um, empathy and, you know, there's just so much that happens not understanding each other and 
this goes down to two ways. One, from uh, an employer, and two, from your fellow co-workers. So in terms of employers, um, what should they should be... Uh, for me, I would advise them to give um, medical covers you know, that actually deal with therapy. Therapy is very important. Let me tell you, therapy is nice. Therapy is, you know, it's, it doesn't mean, I don't, for me, it doesn't mean that you're sick. It doesn't mean that you're going through something. It just means that every, because every single day you're going through something, so you're processing a different type of emotion. Yeah. So you, you don't even understand what it is. Today it can be joy. So somebody will ask you, why is this making you happy? Or why did this make you sad? It doesn't mean, you know, um, you're sick or anything else. So therapy is something that should be part, and, and not just for any filmmaker, but just anybody in general, whether a mother, a wife, a doctor, um, anybody, a student. It's a good way to just process your emotions every single day and just be in tune. So for me, um, in terms, when it comes to employment, first things first is definitely... Um, in fact, before I go to the medical cover, for me, first things first, even as a human being, is always extend grace and empathy. That is the first thing you need to do. Anybody here, you know, today you may just come and talk to me and I'll just be so rude and you're wondering, okay, what is wrong with this rude girl? But maybe Asubui, we did, I did not have, you know, I did not have money to come to this place. Mm -hmm. Or uh, yesterday, my husband uh, will beat me up. Mm -hmm. Or you know, we do not know what somebody is going through. So first things first is always extend the next person grace and empathy. And that comes whether it is your employer, whether it is your employee, whether it is your friend, whether you're in a set, whether it just treat the next person as a human being. Um, secondly, is now in terms of, of course, what I'm saying is. Let's provide medical cover. Have you guys, I don't know who has watched Billions here. Has anybody watched Billions? Yeah? Did you see Billions? They had, they actually had a therapist inside the office. Oh. So that in case when the stocks are going down or you're not performing, they'd be like, okay. And of course it is confidential. That information is not going to your employer. They'll probably just advise in a low-key way, but they will, there's absolutely nothing that you share comes out of that door. Okay. But you see, it enhances your performance. So for me, I would actually, I don't know if that would, in fact, in the entertainment industry, if having a therapist just on board, a counselor, you know, just a paid counselor, you guys, every week, once a week, go. I think it would improve it should just improve everything by 90%. It should improve the activities, it should improve the film, it should improve, even your, people will come to work happy, people will actually know how to talk to each other, you'll know, okay, today uh, Liz is, you know, she's come at me today, maybe I've triggered her in this type of way. Another thing is also identifying people's triggers and also identifying your own triggers. As you identify, I know maybe when I tell, I speak to Liz in this certain manner, it's going to trigger her. So it's up to me to, I, you know, come at this different way. And also for me, I know this situation is going to trigger me. So let me not be in that situation. So for me, I feel like it's a two-way street. It's you and the next person. But for, for me, 60% is you. 60% is up. how do you talk to yourself? Command the day that you want to have. And of course, it's not easy. Some days are good and some days are bad. Also recognize some days are good and some days are bad. You will never be 100% healed. So just, you know, it's like grief. Grief is something that you'll never get over. But it means as you go along, some days are going to be better. But there's one day you're going to wake up and you're just going to miss this person. And it's okay. So also just understand that it's okay to have bad days. It doesn't mean that you're back to square one. It means that you're in tune with your triggers. So from an industry perspective, I think we need to be more open. We need to have these discussions. We need to have more men, more children, more people come in front. It's not an embarrassing thing to go through what you go through every day because everybody is going through something every single day. And it's... This, we need to have just more of these conversations, whether it's at your workplace, whether it is um, in, a co in a conference like this, uh, wherever it is. And also let's get, um, even you know, Chiromo and um, you know, Dr. Liz is from uh, Madare, and what, to still continue to do this outreach to people so that people can just be able to understand that it is okay. Whatever you're going through, it is okay. You can either get well through medication or just by self-awareness and acting. I know um, uh, Gadoni said 30% is awareness, <laughs> but the 70% is the actual work. 
Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes you don't even need medicine. So and also when you're self-aware, you just need now the seventy percent to now get better. And just understand, like I'm saying, there are good days and there are bad days. So for me, it's just a collective. It's collective between the industry, of course, the governance, of course, as an individual, and just any other person. Yeah. And now, uh, right, get into the treatment and coping mechanism uh, that uh, Doctor is going to take us through here. I'll go back to you, Doctor Ruth. We are having. We're talking about. We were talking about the trends of mental health here. Yeah? Now there's a trend. It's very common. It's been there since time immemorial. You know, when uh, Kina to to Park and Biggie were like, you know, you diss me, I diss you. you. Fight, I fight you back. What are some of our? What are we seeing? How are we going to tell? How are we telling the society when, uh, like, I see most of us in the creative industry, when I fight with one artist, I'll go on social media, I diss them, I insult them, I post nasty things about them. What are the dangers of doing this? Not only to the person posting, but the person they're posting about, yeah. Okay, I think it comes down to our discussion on, you know, film industry, technology and social media as a driver of mental illness. So what uh, social networking sites and social media does is it gives people a voice, people who would have otherwise not had a voice. Often you don't know just how to manage this power you're given. So if you fight with someone and you go and post it, you feel powerful because you've made this person feel um, bad because they made you feel bad. You will not consider how they feel, but there's also the, the vice versa. So what happens when it comes back to you? And we've had um, a lot of these cases, even within um, our industry. We know of uh, creatives or artists who are bullied because of something. And then it later came out that even the bullies got bullied and, you know, it, 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 it affected them. So I think the problem with um, our technology revolution is it's moving really fast. Yeah. We, we are not even um, at par with it in how we train our children, for example, or young adults to deal with mental health and certain things on social media. We have people who, in, in a quest to you know, become famous, they would overshare, but you don't know that certain things can be used against you. And so we are not, we've not reached a place where we are training people on this, yes. Now, Dr. Gadoni, back to you. It's always a norm, and uh, just giving it a brief um, uh, answer so that we can give the mic to the audience. Uh, they can interact with us. We always have this um, issue. When somebody feels depressed, okay, the solution will be, I think I'll do a smoke, I'll smoke my weed, I'll take alcohol. What are the challenges in terms of now getting addicted to these drugs and now solving that mental illness or condition that you've gotten the diagnosis for? Uh, thank you, Liz. I was smiling because of the word brief. <laughs> <laughs> but just allow me, you know, every time I get opportunities like this, because I'm really passionate about awareness more than I am treatment, is just to highlight, you know, the word I like to use is vitukwa ground. Mm. So I really want to, allow me just to talk about uh, two main issues before I get into treatment, the medical part of it. Um, remember when I told you about the people who are left standing? You remember that? Okay. Did we have more men or women standing? Women. Right? So I want to start by talking about suicide, okay? And to first emphasize that as practitioners, as advocates, we are saying we need to move away from using committing, committing suicide, suicide to death by suicide. Because if we add the word committing there, then we are making it a crime. Mm. We don't say committed AIDS or mm. committed diabetes, right? Yeah. We acknowledge that those guys are suffering from something. So, first of all, suicide is that at the top, okay, leading cause of death amongst young people, people yeah. right? So, between men and women, who are likely to attempt suicide more? Men or women? Women. Mm-hmm. I can't hear. Men. Okay. So, we are here to learn. Women. Yeah 
have the highest suicidal attempts. Being in a hospital setup, I can't even begin to tell you the number of people who come in because of attempted suicides. In all the schools that we go to, universities, um, primaries and high schools, we have more women than men who attempt suicides. However, we have more men than women who die by suicide. And maybe there's a cultural connotation to that, you know. We keep saying that, you know, men are strong, yeah. Mm. You know, kind of thing. Exactly, I like that. So even by the time a man is actually getting to choose a means for suicide, then they are likely to choose the means that they know almost 99% that they will go through with it. And why am I telling you this? Because we are each other's keepers. And suicidal ideations are not expressed in black and white as we think. Somebody is not going to say, you know, I've decided to go buy a rope today and this is my plan. Suicidal ideations are expressed in the most subtle ways. Yeah? So, when you hear an individual talk about me, Maisha, I'm just tired. Yeah? We categorize that as an expression of how they are feeling. When you hear an individual talking about, I wish I could sleep and never wake up, as subtle as that. When you hear somebody saying, I miss you only, come on to survive. Yeah? And on that note, the three major causes of stress that trigger mental illnesses at the top of the list is finances, relationship issues, and work pressure. If you have two out of those three, you're four times likely to trigger depression. Imagine, yet these are things that we interact with every single day of our lives. And Waidera, when Waidera mentioned about um, me talking about 30 to 70 percent, that was in reference to self-awareness. We're talking about self-awareness. And I was telling them it's not enough just to be self-aware. You know, a lot of people say, ah, me niko self-aware, na jijua. That is not enough. It is only 30% for you to know I am suffering. 70% is the action. The second thing I want to talk about is adverse childhood experiences. A lot of the times when we see people depressed, anxious, the dysfunctionality, you know, the alcohol and substance abuse, yeah. I'm telling you guys, that is the end result. And wellness is actually pushing the conversation from focusing on what's wrong with this person, from focusing on the labels and the diagnosis, to asking the question. And even as employers, you need to ask the question, what happened to this person? How did they get here? And we are acknowledging that even if things happened 20 years ago in your life, in your childhood, there was some form of dysfunctionality, neglect. Yeah? And you know trauma is assessed as if you see it directly happening, if you hear it, okay? So for those people who could have grown up in a domestic violence issue and you never saw your parents fighting but you heard the commotion, that is equally strong enough to cause you some form of trauma in adulthood. <clears throat> okay? And of course if it's happening directly um, to you. So it's to you if you observe or if you hear adverse childhood experiences. And this is just to caution each and every one of us. We need, and we've heard the statistics, we've heard the history. It's just to ask yourself that question. How am I actually doing? Can I go and seek help? Not when it's worst case scenario. By the time you're already not sleeping for three days or talking to yourself, it's already too late. Yeah, from a wellness, um, perspective yeah and before treatment I just want to say we usually express ourselves in certain ways there are three anger styles and I want you to literally assess yourself today and see where do I fall the first one is acting out this is a category of people who you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of somebody saying you know kind of a thing yeah if you're driving and you're caught by a cop 
and you have an acting out kind of a person, you start telling them, let me handle this, don't talk, because they'll get you into trouble, right? Then we have the people who use displacement. Yeah, so these are people who project their anger on something or somebody who is less likely to harm them in the same equal measure. So kama kuna stress nyumbani, you take it um, at home and vice versa. And the third anger style is usually barring. Yeah, so for one reason or another, maybe that person doesn't know how to express themselves or they just, you know, they feel like it's too much work to address such issues. Where the community is concerned, we usually look at the acting out person Mm. Yeah. They like drama. And then we look at the person who buries as a nice person. You know, they don't like drama, they don't like issues. Right? But in our psychological world, the person who is more likely to actually get a mental illness is the barring one, as opposed to the one who acts out. And I'm just trying to say that just because somebody is quiet, just because somebody does not express stuff, it doesn't mean that they are not hurting. So if you know somebody either went through a, hard, um, a bad heartbreak or they're having trouble at work or they had um, a heavy childhood growing up, that is enough to actually prompt you to want to create a safe space um, for that person. Okay, so where, where do you get help? Even before we get to the medical, because the model has changed today, we don't jump into giving people medication. Um, the first thing is, we know how to measure your blood pressure, okay? And all those things. So I don't know if you guys have some bookmarks. Let me see. Are there any bookmarks you have? Can you wave the bookmarks? Yes, okay. So those bookmarks actually have screening tools that you can engage in a self-assessment. So if you're in this crowd today and you're wondering, could I be depressed? You know, nowadays I'm sad, I easily cry, I've been withdrawn. Do the patient health questionnaire. Do the one for anxiety. We've talked about substance use. Do the one for audit. And know from today where do you lie and it's completely anonymous. Nobody is going to know. Where else do you get help if you can't? We've talked about insurance, but let me see by a show of hands, how many are covered by insurance? How many people are covered by insurance? Yeah, we can see that. And my challenge today is to utilize all the toll-free numbers. That card absolutely has toll-free numbers, 0800 to 2000. But then we also have Red Cross, 1190. We have 1199. We have K&H. They offer resources. Yeah, there is Kiambu Hospital. I'm from Kiambu. I can talk about Kiambu Hospital. It's 50 shillings. Madara, it's 500. The practitioners are the same. So go get help. Yeah, so because you're calling anonymously saying, this is what is happening to me. I need help. Educate yourself. Remember, you cannot lead others if you don't lead yourself. Never forget that. You can't lead others if you don't lead yourself. And as creatives, everything that creatives literally churn out is not for themselves most of the time. It's for other people. So where do you come in? Who is that person who is left to take care of you? Okay? Last but not least, you've heard about self-care. But I want you guys to write down the word empress. All right? When you're talking about self-care, sometimes we think about it's because I went and did my hair or it's because I went and watched a game and there's nothing wrong with all those things. But you are not engaging in any form of self-care if you don't recognize that you're made up of different facets of your life. And unless you begin to intentionally take care of those different areas of your life, there is no self-care that you're doing. Empress, the first E, Emotions. How are you? How are you emotionally? Are you able to understand your triggers? Are you able to understand why you're down? And what is it that you need to do to actually ensure that you address those, those emotions? Mentally, and when I like to talk about mentally, what really clouds uh, our mental space are two things. One, thoughts, but the other thing is the exposure. What we keep absorbing over and over, which is social media. How many people have done a social media detox? 12 hours? Okay, 48 hours? 
I love that, okay? Do that social media detox for yourself. Even WhatsApp, sometimes those things, they just need to be muted a little bit for a while so that you can just recharge your battery. The P is for physical wellness, physical self-care. Let me tell you guys, the game changer of overall well-being is physical um, fitness, physical activities. It's the only natural way to ensure that your brain is performing optimally. Okay? The R is recreation, other than what you're doing for other people. And when you're um, disconnecting, go do something that is going to cater to the inner child that you have. Go do something with adrenaline. Go be happy, laugh out loud. Okay? The other E is environment. How is the surrounding that is around you? It can really help a lot. And that's why you hear a lot of people saying, when a woman is stressed, wanaenda wanaosha kila kitu kwa nyumba. Yeah, they're trying to, you know, declutter their space. Yeah. All right? And then S is for social, social self-care. Very, very important. And the last S. Na hii tuneza debate mkitaka vanya mnataka, but it's a fact. Mm -hmm. It's spirituality. Studies actually show that people who have a spiritual encourage have better quality of life. So I'm not here to talk about a church or a certain <laughs> preacher. I'm just saying, saying, do you have a connection between you and your higher power? And one of the best ways to, to address that is just to simply use the serenity prayer. Have you guys heard of the serenity prayer? Right? It's simple. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know okay. the difference. That's it. Thank you. Ah, interesting. So, I want to go back to you, uh, Liz, but first I want to give the mic to the audience before we cut them short. See, time is not really on our side. So, I'd like around four people to speak out. Somebody please give them the mic. Okay. So, three people. One more young person. Do you have a question? Is there any young person who wants to talk? You're young. I want a uniform. I'm referring to those who are in uniform. Okay, because of gender balance, there's no other lady. So here we have three people. So you. I still insist, aren't a young person? You two. Okay, you're giving the mic. Ah, interesting. So, so let's start. In front. All right. uh, thank you very much. My name is Duncan Moronio, an actor and co-founder of Amazing Minds Association, uh, Amazing Minds Africa. We based in campuses and ours is promotion of mental health among uh, young people. Nice. Um, two questions. Mm -hmm. So one is about is alcoholism or drug use is it the trigger or is it an end product of mental, um, you know, get a point. Um, my question is this. We've been in that industry just talking about mental health with, uh, in campuses, universities, for the last four years. And we're always trying to find fun ways of having conversations around mental health. Okay. I just want to throw this to you guys. Is it possible to have mental health conversation in a fun way or is it a tax conversation? Okay. It, it has nothing to do with fun, it's just facts. Thank you. Thank you so much, first and foremost. Good job you're doing with the young people. So do we take all the questions first or we tackle this one? First? You'll take the first part of the question, Dr. Ari. Liz, you'll take the second part. You know, and actually this is also part of it, how to handle mental wellness, awareness among young people, even dealing with it. So you take part one, take part two. And then think, beautiful ladies, you can tip, chip in, okay? So another question? Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening. And good evening, everyone. My name is Ezekiel. I'm the chairperson of the Kenya Film and Television Professionals Association. And what a wonderful panel. And uh, I don't know if it was deliberate or it's something to observe that it's an old ladies panel. But I'll take it as an observation that okay. the ladies have risen above the stigma of mental health. Mm -hmm. Now, the creative industry, and if I 
pay attention to the film industry. It's very unique because the process of creation really rotates around dopamine. Mm -hmm. You have two coins of the divide. The first side is what you call the reward system. Anybody who creates wants to feel nice about their end product. And when they don't feel nice about their end product, it messes around with their dopamine. Okay. The other half of the divide is when they don't get feedback and validation from the work that they have put out. Sure. And you, if you take those two big scenarios, what we are observing in our industry is that people like us in Nairobi, Mombasa, and maybe Eldoret are very fortunate because we can have such conversations, that we have access, that you can be next to someone who will tell you, you need therapy. Yeah. And here's a WhatsApp number of somebody. Mm -hmm. But we make a very small fraction of our industry, but we overlap because everybody works around the country differently. Today we work in Mombasa, tomorrow we'll be in Turkana. So my big question is, is the push or the awareness creation around creative seeking mental health creating does is it creating a new stigma within the sector where there are people who feel like these guys are able to access this mental health care mm -hmm. and we can't because there's definitely need to level up with the entirety of the creative sector so my question to you is, that is there a deliberate approach? I know everyone in the panel is from yeah. different sectors, but it's something you can think of to figure out a clever way to level up so that the creative in Mombasa, the creative in Nakuru can have, even if it's not the same, but can have opportunity okay. to interact with these solutions. That's my first question. My second question is to the clinical doctors. You've dealt with cases. And I will speak very boldly and openly. As a, a leader of KFTPA, we have suffered losses where um, death has occurred by suicide. And when we look into that, the unique stressors come back to finances and all these other things. However, there has never been a deliberate effort to integrate within our operations as production companies, okay. mental health in our ways of working. So is there a way you can define programs or stakeholder engagements with the people who employ? These are producers and production companies and commissioning companies, so that we can make silent and written laws of how we work with each other and develop that problem to scale up through the other places in the country. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you, for the rest, let's make our questions brief to the point. So question one, Waidera, you'll take it, Daktari, second one, us as well. Then where, who is that young person? Oh, young person, okay. <laughs> make your question brief and to the point. Where is the mic? Young person, you're a young person. Kimbia. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Hi, I'm Waidera. Hi, my name is Faith. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a mental illness, suicide survivor. Let me just say that. Wow. So my question is partly... Good uh, job. Clap for her. Thank you. It's so bold. Uh, Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. At some point, you just have to, you know, survive. <laughs> My question is, Love your attitude. the triggers, you've said it's finances, relationship, and work pressure. I feel like AZ has partly asked it, but I will ask it. It was a question to you to help him. Because I feel like uh, the film industry is literally a catalyst to the triggers, especially the financial one and the work pressure. What do you think we, what do you think the KFTPA should be doing differently to help the people working in the industry become more self-aware and more open to, you know, seeking help in regards to mental health? Yeah. Thank you, Faith. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you so much. Young person, I'm proud of you. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm a survivor too. We'll fight to live. Sawa, keep up. So, uh, 
You have a question? Am I to read been asked? You you raised your hand. Yeah, do you have a question? Okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, hi, how are you all doing? Hi. My name is Jay Tariq. I am a mental health advocate. I am a dancer and choreographer. Nice. And it feels absolutely amazing to actually have a conversation like this in public. And I had questions, but I feel like you guys have some heavy questions in <laughs> on our side. So I could say something um, because I am an entertainer and I do love how it feels to give back to people. So um, I just want to say what you guys made me feel in the time that I was here. And then you guys can proceed, is that cool? Cool. All right, cool. So the Gen Z and the Gen Alpha, those are people born from 2000, 1997 to like 2012 and then onwards, are products of previous generations which were very experimental. Think about it. 1984, 1950, 1800s. What did people understand schizophrenia is? We, did, we actually get to know, and as you had said earlier, that we are privileged, like where we're at. So shout out to you if you're a suicide survivor. Shout out to you if you're thinking about, yeah, snap, yeah, snap. <laughs> Good job. Uh -huh. You know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling so much, I'm feeling so much. Let me keep this brief. Kindly. Um, they relate to us, but they won't let us be us, which is just a younger them in a different time. Parents need to make safe spaces for their own children. And, yeah, I, I don't want to trigger nobody, but all of you are appreciated, and I'm glad that all of you are here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for your kind words. Please clap. You can eat my coffee. Sweet one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all the best. Ah, another young person, the last one now, in uniform. Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm Jidan Junge in Alliance High School, um, 1567, and um, I'm really loving your work and um, I actually have, uh, I'm actually a junior, junior co to, to um, a mental awareness program for the disabled called Amiz. Wow. Um, it's in loving memory of one of my friends who was disabled. His name was Tyler. And I really, really do know what he was aiming for to avoid suicide and stuff. Um, because he wanted to speak out as a junior person. Um, now to my question, um, many causes of suicide, as you have said, it is the main, the main topic of um, the main, it's the main cause of um, de um, life depletion and um, very many things that have to do with the decrease of population. So. Um, there are two types of suicide, rational and irrational. Now, if you take into account the rational types of death that could affect someone else, um, take, for take for example, um, um, I was also a suicide survivor because I had learned about Tyler's death and my suicide. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I had known, my sister is um, eight, 18, turning 19. She, um, I really felt a heavy negative, it's like an anchor to my heart. Uh, she, take, uh, she takes drugs, um, I really did feel pity for her. I just wanted to try to help her before it's too late. But I've always, tr but uh, um, me, in representative to other people, we've always been afraid of making a mistake that can just plant them further into stuff like those drugs. So, to my question, um, what should you do in case you make uh, a mistake 
in trying to console someone would you, how would you take it into approach without any cause of suicide or anything to the, to the topic of that yeah that's my question thank you so much and congratulations <laughs> clap for him again the survivor good job so i think uh uh we go to the questions already asked there's another one okay make it brief 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 brief, brief come, sir. extremely brief so i think uh liz you'll take that on how to good evening help. my name is marianne akini nungo i am an actor mm -hmm. um generally speaking um speaking uh trauma and mental wellness in regards to memory lapses um, there is a connection there, and especially in regards to memory lapses, is it is is can therapy reverse that? Okay. Just that, and also there's something um, Gadoni mentioned about the rates fifty five hundred in different institutions. Because, yeah. If you would just repeat that again. Of course. So in her rejoinder, she's going to give you the toll toll free numbers where to seek help. She'll repeat that. And I, I believe those people who do not have the bookmarks will be given. So can you also reach out to her? Mom Sumba Apatia. She has plenty of them. So while you are away, there's this, <laughs> there's the new concept. And don't you, you make it as brief as possible, you know? How can you make the film space industry safer for young people? Okay? People who are consumers and people who are also content creators. Because we had very nice young people here, survivors of suicide. And uh, we want to see how we can, you know, use it as a tool that is effective enough. Because initially it told us that it's destructive at some point. Now we're going to start with Edera about the challenges that we're facing, you know, from uh, the question that was thrown by... Remind me your name? No, him. Me? The chairman. So, <laughs> that acronym is too long. So, um talking about the challenges that you're facing and then tight with how we can extend this to let's say a content creator or a film director in Turkana, Samburu, in other areas. Karibu. Um, I personally feel like the CEO should have answered this question in terms of what the, yes. You have an answer. <laughs> I personally feel like the CEO should have, uh, this is the CEO for the Kenya Film Commission so I'll just let him speak. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. Good evening sir. Actually, I want to throw back the challenge to the chairman <laughs> that we as Kenya Film Commission, we should work together with yourself to come up with a toolkit that will condition all producers that health issues are a mandatory element that we must be able to actually address as far as these issues are concerned. So as part of the filming guidelines, we must address the issue of health. I think that is the solution I wanted to give. Okay. And then maybe before you sit down, there's the other proposal in terms of uh, including or involving other stakeholders. There's a proposal of, you know, working with the likes of Dr. Ari here to have a team that can help, or even working with Liz, have a therapist. Do you think it's something that can be executed? We can have therapists? As part of the framework, we should be able to come up with a clear roadmap that on a regular basis, we should be able to work with the U.S. health professionals nice. so that we are able to address these matters. Not like a one-off, but as a continuous element. Nice, nice, nice. Good job. Sante Sana, thank you so much. Now, back to... You can take the question next. It was the first question that you asked. Yeah, please be brief. I'll Papa be Dan. brief. Yes, please, please. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, we, we did... We signed what we call employee assistant programs with organizations, so we are actually open. I was hoping Beryl is here somewhere who is in charge of corporate, but she's, we actually did come with her. Um, I look at creatives the same way we look at um, our Olympians in this country. Yeah? So with the partnership we have with uh, the National Olympic Committee is that we are able, we get access to work with each and every one of them on an individual capacity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once the MOU is signed, then we know these people can reach out to this pool of psychologists, not just to them, but also to the family, because you don't exist alone. Yeah? You exist amongst um, a community. So that's something that we can look into. Um, 
I think this was uh, the chairman who asked in terms, was it the chairman who asked in, no, it was Duncan who yeah, asked um, the question about substance use. So there's usually the question of what precedes the other, okay? What, there's something we call a dual diagnosis or comorbidity. So we have cases where because somebody has been abusing drugs, actually the younger you are in terms of the onset of using drugs, and when I say drugs, I'm talking about cigarettes, mira, I'm not even talking about cocaine and heroin. No, 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 those, that's those basic ones. Um, then you find that those individuals <laughs> to mental illnesses later. And the NACADA statistics actually show the onset today of drug and substance abuse is nine years. Yeah. So imagine if you start that at nine years, by the time you get into such a high pressure um, environment, then you're much more vulnerable. So there's the drugs that induce mental illnesses. Alcohol in itself is a depressant as a substance. Okay, so the more you drink it, it might seem to work like short term, to be honest, that's why people take it. But the long term part of it is that it actually impairs the ability of the brain to be able to resolve his own issues. It actually impairs uh, what the chairman talked about, the reward system. Yeah. But truthfully speaking, there are a lot of people with undiagnosed mental health issues that are trying to cope. And to be very, very honest, even as a practitioner, I don't even try to dogmatize substances. You don't know why that person is drinking or smoking. Yeah, there is something that they are really trying to cope with. And my question usually is to be careful in the sense of, as you're using this tool to cope, is it helping you be better? or is it making things worse? There's a famous quote that says, the problem is not the problems. The problem is the attitude you have towards the problem and the coping. Yeah, that's Jack Sparrow, for those of you who are millennials. Anyway, yes, okay. So, of course, you're going to have underlying problems, but then how you cope can actually uh, make it worse. And when you come to a clinician, we need to actually distinguish which came first so that we are able to create a treatment plan that will really focus on the best possible way um, to treat you. And then the question of memory, the brain is designed to protect you. Children have higher defense mechanisms than adults. I don't know if you guys knew that. Yeah. Yes, a child can go through rape. They didn't go to school, they walked kilometers. For those of you whose parents tell you that they walked 10 kilometers <laughs> in the rain, they survived. Yeah, children have higher defense mechanisms than adults. But as you begin to transition, especially um, from 16 years, from 14, 16, and early adulthood, the defense mechanisms go down to pave way for the body to develop physiologically. So in layman, you'll hear people saying, um, to really change. You know, the way you used to be such a good kid, the way you used to be clever. But we are not asking what happened to this person. So because of that, because of those defense mechanisms, you'll find that if somebody has suffered trauma, they are missing a gap in their life. They really cannot recall. But as you continue growing older, this information begins to seep slowly by slowly from your unconscious to the subconscious to the conscious. Yeah, then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're flooded by all this anger, emotions, and you don't really know, you know, who this is or whose body um, you are in. Yeah, so can that be reversed? I think intense therapy is very, very important. Sometimes I usually ask people, do you really want to go back there? and an earth because there are specific trauma treatments like EMDR that can open up um, that channel. But sometimes there's a reason why that is blocked in the first place. Um, so it, it just depends on your mental resilience. Because when you op open up that channel to an individual, sometimes you could make it worse for them. And that's why therapy is very heavy. I usually tell people when you're going to therapy, it's not going to be a walk in the park because you're relieving those moments. Yeah. So. Thank you so much. So to Liz, also briefly, uh, you, you were to take us through you know, matters to the consideration uh, to take into yeah, matters to take into consideration and you're tackling mental health among the youth and uh, I think you're going to tie it with the questions that they 
uh, post, like you said, how do I make sure that while I'm helping somebody else, I'm also not putting myself in, uh, in, in, yeah, in pain or in danger. So kindly mark them. It's on. Let me let me answer his question first. He asks, uh, how 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 do you help someone without uh, making them go through the whole process of suicide? And uh, we take suicide very seriously, whether someone is joking or not joking, because we don't know. So, when you hear someone saying, like she mentioned a few, a few things that people say, like, I want to go and never come back. I wish I was not here. I don't even know why I'm here. Subtle talks like those. You want to take it very seriously, and uh, you should not even worry about, you'll do something that will make them your, your worry will be, should be, what if you don't do something? Yeah, and the best thing to do is to know that when someone is talking like that, first of all, they are sick, they are unwell. They are at the very end of their depression because it's, it's, it's depression that pushes you to those levels of wanting to go. So when you hear someone talking like that, the best thing, if you're in school, go to a school counselor, a trusted teacher, someone you can talk to, so that you tell them that this is happening, and then that will be taken and, 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 and dealt with in, in a good environment, and the person will receive the help they need. Because a lot of times when, when, when people want to commit suicide, it's because there's something, there's something that is missing in their lives. Maybe it's the finances, the stresses of relationships and all those things. So it's, it's, it's better you do something then you worry about what if, you know? Because if you keep quiet, then it becomes, you, you never know what will happen. So it's for us to take suicide conversations very, very seriously, and, and, and just to take us to a place where you always think, who is my community of support? As, as an individual, do I have people around me that I can say, these are my guys, and how are they your guys if they don't even know where you are at in life? What is bothering you? What are you doing? What is exciting you in your life at this point? You know, having people around you who you can say, I can call on so-and-so if I have a financial need. I can talk to so-and-so if I'm stressed about my relationships. I have this other person and this other person. And that will help us even in the industry so that we are more intentional even in our friendships. You, you, you don't just see that guy behind the camera and you really don't know anything about them. Let us be intentional in our relationships. Let us take a step beyond their name, beyond what they do. And also to, to, to even remember that we need to separate. This, this industry is very difficult to separate, like, like what uh, the chairman spoke about. If, if I don't get the dopamine from my production, then that really doesn't go well with me. But you need to separate that you are not your success, you are not your failure. Mm -hmm. and, and just like she said, the problem is the problem. The problem is not you. The problem is the coping. So even as artists, even as people who do very excellent work, when it's not so good, you have to separate. It is not, it is not me who has failed. So that you, 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 you don't bash yourself so much and, and forget that today sometimes it's good, sometimes it's, it's not so good. That, that's just to mention what you had. And then he had also asked about are there other ways of talking about mental health you in, know, a fun in, way, in, a, in a fun way? way. And, and, and I would ask you, what are other fun things that you can do apart from those other things that you feel are not fun things? Mm -hmm. You know, you challenge yourself, you know, and even know when do I stop? You know, if, if we are drinking and I'm having fun, when do you stop? You know, do you know yourself to know that Nikifika apa, I need to stop, you yeah. know? I, I, I worked with someone who told me that she knew it was time to change jobs. When the mother came to visit her at the office and she forgot her for four hours because she was busy editing. You know? I mean, 
you know, it's, it's, she was doing something good. The work had consumed her. But the mother was just there patiently waiting because she knew. Sometimes she keeps me here for one hour, but she still comes. Mm. But imagine four hours. She knew it, it was time for her to move. So we must know what are our, our limits. What limits do we have? Okay. And when you know your limits, then you know, this is my time to okay. go. You know? This is my time to change. You know? And, and just to briefly mention mm. some of the, what, what she's, she's talking about, the challenges of being a young person and also you're in this industry. You, you have to consider where you are at in your life cycle. You know, you're at a time uh, when, when you want to form relationships with people. You want that sense of belonging. You know, and, and, and you, you, you are asking yourself, how does this play out? How do I integrate where I am in my life and this profession? Because they have to go hand in hand. How do you strike that balance so that you don't feel like you are failing in other areas and you're giving so much in this, in, this, in this one area? So finding that balance, accepting that this is where I am in life. This is what is expected uh, of me. And forget about people's expectations. You yourself know when you want to do what. You know, forget about the parents said after you finish college, you get a job after you get a job, you get married or a family or whatever, but you have to know for yourself, when do I want to do this and how do I balance that with my career so that everything is working out in a balanced way. Thank you so much. You're grateful. Briefly, so that now we can close this chapter and I'm going to give my panelists, each and every one of you, strictly, I underline strictly, you give us the closer, uh, give us a, what are the, some of the recommendations, proposals that you can give so that we can, at least we've talked about everything, so we need to give a solution. What do we expect, as in, what do we want in, um, in the long run? How can we help? How can we assist in all this creative content creators, creative directors in the film industry. How do we help them? What are some of the possible solutions that I hope uh, C Mr. CEO here might uh, adapt and help in, you know, uh, diverting it or, you know, thinning it out to the rest of the industry. So you give us your response. Yes, your response. And, and I'll close at, and close the, at the same time. So I'd, I'd first want to respond to Duncan. You asked about what are the fun ways to talk about mental health. One of the ways we've found to talk about illness, and, and you know we've studied it and researched, is using games. So there's a game that we developed that we use to train um, children on how to identify sickle cell disease and how to deal with it. It's a very, very um, innovative way to bring in the conversation of game with adolescents. Nowadays we have uh, VR technology, and there are already groups who are using this to spread mental wellness. But then there's also role playing and playing. So we may not know it, but people in their own way uh, have what they think mental health is and mental illness and mental wellness. And if you put them in that situation where they can role play together, then you're able to bring it out in a fun way. So I think those are the things you can consider and I'm happy to you know, t share with you these experiences we've had. The next thing I wanted to do was to slightly answer chairman and Mr. CEO and as I'm closing. So in, 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 you know, in tackling any health issue, you have to remember that at the outset, health is a very complex system. And so it, it may not be, and, and sorry, you have to deal with it, these issues or even this mental health in the film industry from three layers. You have the micro layer, which is the individual actors. You have the meso layer, which is within different production companies or groups and organizations like yours. And then you have the macro layer, where you have the Kenya Film Commission, where you have government, and then you have also global partners. Because as I said, right now, mental health is a very big global, global priority. And so where the money goes is where the effort goes. So you have to think of it through this. In terms of coming up with frameworks, they already exist, which is good because you're not starting from the bottom. Uh, I mentioned the study that was done by the British um, film, and I think it's called BAFTA, uh, and what they did is they actually came up with a, with a toolkit that other production companies can use. And we have toolkits that have also been made by Canada and the US, and you can um, 
try and adapt this for the Kenyan situation. In South Africa, I think the group is called Independent Black Filmmakers Co Collective. They've also come up with a, a toolkit that's useful for the South African um, situation. So it's not hard. But what, what I think we need to remember is, as I said, we do not have data on this problem in Kenya. We cannot use the 9 out of 10 in the UK or the 70-something percent in the US. As we are planning on coming up with our own, you know, our own toolkits and our own um, ways to tackle mental health in the workplace, we actually need to know how bad is the problem. It's not enough that we're telling you um, people in the film industry have anxiety and depression. Do we know what it is in our setting? And so I think the beginning of all this is to actually do and commission our own studies to get this data, do cost-effectiveness analysis. If you're making a case for mental health, and which is what we've done globally, um, no, sorry, locally, when you're coming up with a mental health policy in Kenya, is you have to show cost-effectiveness. Again, with the British team, they showed that mental illness in their staff is costing their industry $300 million every year. Do we know what the mental illness in our film industry is costing us, us yeah. as Kenyans? Mm -hmm. And once we have that, mm -hmm. we can make a case for these things. And then also now do feasibility studies. It's, it's, it's fine to tell people, here is a toolkit we've developed, but do you know if it'll work? Mm -hmm. So you have to come up with a toolkit and then you know, conduct feasibility studies to see whether it'll work. So it, it's good that we're starting there and Truly, my challenge to you is generate local data. Let's not depend on what others are telling us. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much, Asante Sadaktari. Waidera, close it. Um, I actually think uh, Dr. Liz has really summed up uh, that part. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Doc, sorry, not Liz. Uh, Dr. Ruth has really summed up that in terms of governance, because you need to get data in order to know what you're going to lobby for. So I think she's really summed up that perfectly. And again, now my second response is just, again, I go back to humans. Um, Maya Angelou said, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you do, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're next to somebody, just again, I keep saying, extend grace. Extend grace, extend empathy. Because you do not know, you never know how much you saved somebody's life that day, that minute. You know, you never know what you've said, something encouraging. You probably do not know that person was going home at night to do something different. So always just extend grace, extend um, empathy, okay. and just wake up and try and make everybody else feel good and also yourself feel good and fight for yourself. Always fight for yourself, regardless. Mm -hmm. Fight for yourself. Wake up and fight for yourself every single day. I think that's my parting shots. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Give us your parting shot. First, um, Duncan, we are ready to partner with you. We run the Tufunguke campus tours. Uh, I don't know if you know of that. And then I saw IMAX here. So we also partner with IMAX to ensure that we bring um, a fun mental health conversation to the youth. We have an event in May where we'll watch a movie, there are games, board games, VR, speed dating. It's so much fun, um, but around uh, mental health. What's um, my speed dating? Eh, sila zmo atwa juane. Yoni pwa. Sawa. Yeah. And I usually say we can never have a mental health conversation if we don't involve people with lived experience. So I'm truly, truly honored to have been in the presence of people who are so bold enough to actually stand up today courageously yeah. this being streamed yeah. yeah to millions of people and say i am a suicide survivor. survivor i have a diagnosis that is so powerful yeah so collective healing is a thing and even to the creatives as much as there's so much stigma as much as you're in the limelight i just want to challenge if just one person can continue talking about their experience then we are going to normalize this conversation and change um, the narrative um, around mental health. Um, and last but not least, this is just a reminder that we need to do better. We definitely need to do better. So my challenge is let's be better and then do better. Each one, teach one. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Daktari. And last but not least, give us your parting shot. Very, very briefly, just uh, let's normalize going for therapy. Let's normalize it, yeah, so that uh, we encourage one another. And so that by the time uh, things are happening, you already have stamina, yeah? And, and just before you go to Daktari, yeah, j j just know, if you, if you fail to pass here, you will end up there, you know? So let's normalize this, and it's never too soon to find a therapist. It's never too soon. So have one in your pocket, you know, on speed dial, yeah, so that we can work together. Mental health workers are many, help is available, and it really saddens our hearts just to hear that uh, people are dying by suicide. You know, people are not able to handle the normal stresses of every day. So we are, we are, we are just saying, let's normalize going for therapy, let's normalize seeing a therapist, and, and it's never too late, too, too soon, actually. It's never too soon to have a therapist. Thanks. Thank you so much, Liz. Uh, so grateful. Uh, thank you so much, lovely people, for sitting down for all those minutes and listening to us. And I hope you've picked something, you've learned something. I'd like to thank my panelists again, uh, Dr. Gavoni Mbugwa. Uh, we have Liz Njenga. We've had Dr. Ruth Lucinde, and we've had a beautiful Vaidera Karen. Remember, we were supposed to have Nini Washida, but she couldn't show up. Something came up, but uh, we are grateful at least. Uh, she, she was part of the panel, but we're very grateful, and I hope we've all learned a lot. And thank you, Sana, and I hope that next time again, we can have something like this. Like May, we have Mental Health Awareness Month, so I think it's a conversation that we should continue having. We are very, very grateful for listening to us, and uh, thank you for hosting us. And one thing I'd like to say as a person living with a mental health condition, like I told you earlier, I've lived with bipolar uh, since I was in high school. It has never stopped me to do anything. And talking about it, seeking help, seeing a therapist, seeing a psychiatrist, getting my medication on time, living with a mental condition is like, like living with, let's say, HIV. You have to take your medication. You know, you have to eat well, you have to exercise. Uh, it's also like, you know, after you've had a kidney transplant, you know, you have to take this medication through and through so that your body does not reject that new kidney. So it's something you can do, it's something you can manage. Um, it happens, you get so sad, you get depressed, but find, I'll find a way to manage it. It has never stopped me from being one of the best journalist in the country. It has never stopped me from winning awards. It has never stopped me from to my son. This is a great mother. I don't look at myself as somebody living with a mental condition. I know it's something I can manage, something I can work with. And then, as Lisa said, always find a strong support system. People can check on you, you know. People can ask you, have you eaten? You know, sometimes you get in our lowest lows and we get depressed and we, people don't see us. But then those people who know you, people who support you, they'll always call you and check on you and always try and be a support system to someone else. So at least we can be together for each other and seek help. So I'm very grateful and I'm happy to see my fellow suicide survivors. Thank you. Keep up. And as Antony Sana and uh, may God bless you. I think we've come to the end of our discussion. To begin in my coffee, Tafadali, please. Lauda. A big round of applause for them. Thank you. If there ever was a session where it was really spoken from the heart, this was one of those, isn't it? An amazing topic right there. And thank you so much for the gems and insights that you've given and sharing of personal stories as well. Before you leave the stage, as always, we shall have that customary photo. So ladies, please stand up. Let us look at this photographer right there. And as always, we smile into that lens. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for them as they take uh, their seats, go backstage. Thank you so much. Sorry. Amazing moderation there as well. Thank you so much, uh, Eunice. Thank you so much for that. And also for sharing your personal story. Asante Sana. Thank you so much. That brings us to the end of day two of our market. Uh, there'll be a mixer that's happening after this, courtesy of Multi Choice. 
So of course we've been talking about how we are coming to share knowledge and network. A lot of networking happening at this particular point in time. There are cocktails going on right outside. If you exit through the left, you'll find it right there. So go meet, network, get those opportunities. There will be a special screening of Zari later this evening, courtesy of uh, MultiChoice, and that will be happening um, right here as well. But that draws the curtains on day two of the festival. We meet tomorrow Friday on the climax of this particular Kalasha uh, International Market session that happens for the next three days. So that happens tomorrow. Tomorrow we're talking about how we can get route to finance. We're talking about the money. How do we get that money? How do we get the funding that we need to make our productions? That happens tomorrow. Uh, also an interesting topic, where do filmmakers retire? What happens once they've gotten to the end of the road? Retirement for filmmakers is a story because you have to think about the end as you start, the end in mind, where do I go with all of this? That topic will be happening right here and a very pertinent conversation happening tomorrow as well. And so much engagement taking place. So we wind up on that. Tomorrow, that's what it waits for us. But between now and then, an amazing networking session courtesy of MultiChoice awaits you. As you exit, have a great evening. Let's meet tomorrow bright and early. Bye-bye.